So, uh, good afternoon. Welcome to the Audit Committee of 17th of October 2022. A um, uh, big welcome to members and officers in the Chamber and also members of the public who are able to access this meeting by live stream. Um, first of all, are there any public questions? No, no public questions. Uh, I haven't received any apologies for absence. We are expecting Councillor Schumann, uh, but he does have to travel to get here, so maybe he'll just uh, uh, arrive a little bit later. Any declarations of interest? That's no. Okay, looking at the minutes. Okay, so um, can I take it that the minutes are accurate and can be agreed? Yes, okay, thank you very much indeed. So uh, we agree the minutes. And then I just wanted to move on to um, uh, Chairman's announcement, something very short. Firstly, I do hope you all had the opportunity for a good break over the summer, and I'm sure you can't probably remember it. Um, but as you will see from the agenda, we have a number of reports coming to this meeting, which we as a committee have requested. And I would like to thank, thank our officers for undertaking the additional work required to produce these reports based on information we have sought as due diligence to support and satisfy our audit function. This allows us to pursue this function whilst being aware that we are not a decision-making body. We are grateful for the way we are working together on this, particularly at a time when the LGA advises us that there will be a greater emphasis from government on the effectiveness of audit going forward. Thank you. Uh, so we uh, come to agenda item six. So this is going to be presented by our chief executive. Thank you, John. Good to Thank see you. Thank you very much, Chair. <laughs> so, uh, John is going to introduce the report and the recommendations on the report. Um, it's on the subject of future provision of internal audit service. And members are requested to extend the current partner, partner and delegation agreement with North Northamptonshire Council from April 2024 until March 2027. And um, do I have a proposal for this? And I'll, I'll second. Um, thank you very much indeed. You'll notice that Rachel has left the room. And that's why she's gone through and she'll be back later. So, John, can I ask you to um, present the report, please? As you said in your announcements, Chair, this was one of the reports where you requested a, an officer to present uh, the report on future provision of internal audit service. And you asked the myself with the support for me and to provide you some options for your consideration of this item and their detail. Well, they're summarized in 3.3 and details in paragraphs 4.2 to 4.5. And hopefully um, that gives a, a clear idea of the options that you face. Um, I've come to a very unambiguous and direct recommendation. Some of the paper reflects that. And I think it, it reflects in and I've given a, the committee an idea in 4.1 to sort of almost my, um, my thoughts on how to come to these recommendations. And I'm sure members have applied those to the options available to them. But I have provided a very direct and unambiguous recommendation and use the word strongly recommend in paragraph 4.6, which we don't regularly do. But I think it reflects um, the opinion of both myself and the um, Section 151 officer to the... Um, the option that we wish to uh, for you to consider, which is detailed in 2.1. Um, can I just point out, um, and thank you, Councillor Kane, for pointing this out to the Section 151 officer. If you are minded not to extend the current contract, we do need to give 12 months notice to internal audit from the 31st of March, 2023. And similarly, if you agree the recommendation, we will have to timetable the requisite notice in future years. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. Any questions of John? Yes, Councillor Kane. Uh, yes, I, I've got questions around um, paragraph 4.4. Um, could, could you uh, expand on that? I think, I, and I think this is an example where I was quite direct um, because I felt um, very strongly uh, that the current service provided by our internal auditors was high performing and perhaps um, that was reflected in quite a um, 
a short paragraph for option three. But the essential option three is, is that we could secure another public sector provider from another council, for example, or I think um, Ian looking for a nod from other public sector providers outside the local government family, where you wouldn't need to go to a formal um, process of um, a tender, which one of the, and that provides a strength on perhaps option four, where you would where fuller there'd be much more fuller costs and a much more labor intensive um, approach to that. So it was there. I think why I, I was quite direct again in that paragraph is I said, yeah, there are advantages to going out to the public sector for the internal audit, particularly in relation to not requiring a formal tender process. But I think if you our view is that if you've got a public sector provider who we believe is highly performing why would you want to go down that particular line but it does provide members an opportunity to test the market informally with the with the public sector provider without the requirement for the full tender probably doesn't give you the advantages of option four with respect to fully knowing the extent of the market thank you yes carry on so if if we accept the recommendation um how how would you be sure that we couldn't have obtained either better prices or improved services for the same cost as i say that's why i think paragraph 4.1 I, I said that the assessment criteria are are, are twofold one is it's, it's essentially an assessment of risk primarily and that's what um, is fundamental to our minds we believe there is a uh, acceptable and manageable risk in continuing with the current what we believe to be an highly performing service what that doesn't give you as councillor Kane po pointed out a full financial appraisal of alternatives what i have tried to do is to give members an idea not only of the current cost of the service, but of the idea of what an uh, what an in-house option would cost you, which will be, I think, after you've added the management costs and resilience costs and bringing in external support be significantly better. What we are, uh, to be brutally frank to Councillor Kay, we aren't able to say another public sector provider would provide you a cheaper service. What we can say to you, is that we believe that the service we're getting is of good value for money and we have some comparators in the document for that but the, the we, we believe this is highly performing and therefore we wouldn't recommend the risk of changing that thank you i i accept that um you've outlined in option one uh what the cost of an in-house um option would be uh and it's at least as high as external uh, and as I think you say in there um, almost certainly not as resilient because it would only be one person so I, I agree that you've um, outlined why option one in-house is not a good option um, I, I agree um, sorry that was option two wasn't it sorry option two is not a good option and I, I, I agree that um, you, you've given us some evidence of the likely sort of a ballpark costs of uh, going externally for a full tendering, which suggests that we would not get anything for anything like what we're currently paying. So I accept that option four is, is not a good option, uh, but I still don't see that we've really assessed option three um, and of course it, it's very clear in our financial procedures that the council seeks value for money in all procurement activity this means obtaining either better prices or improved services for the same cost and i can't see in this paper a clear argument as to why not considering some other public sector providers um, allows us to to say that we have sought this value for money. Um, I can't see any evidence that suggests we wouldn't find a public sector provider who could either provide the same service at a better price or a better service at the same price. I think I probably need to repeat my previous answer, but Councillor Kane's right. This option three does not provide you a financial comparator. 
the the recommendation in relation to extending the current deal is on the basis of performance and what we believe that that current value for money offers. You would still be faced with the same issue if you went to public sector providers without going to an extensive procurement route. You would face the same issues in relation to risk, which is what is the risk of a new provider and the question of that performance being generally unknown other than that provided by referees. But it's a fair point and it's, it's, it's the second most preferable option. Um, I think it's fair to say, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Inskip. Yeah, yes, just really following up on Councillor Kane's you, you, You've told us several times that you believe that the uh, option one is the best option. And obviously, you know, we all believe lots of things, but normally I'm, uh, that's supported by some sort of evidence. I guess what, what, what happened, you haven't done in the remarks so far or in the paper provided any evidence for those beliefs. So I'm, I'm struggling to be able to make a decision around option one when it's purely on your belief rather than on, on particular evidence. So could you elaborate a little bit on the evidence that, that is causing you to, to, to look at that? And what, and the second question I've got is in terms of other public sector providers, have you explored any of those or, or is your belief so strongly that option one is the best option that you you didn't think that was necessary? It serves as a second question, no. And um, clearly that's an option available to the committee. Um, there is time available if you wish to do that. Although there is a cost obviously in respect of officer time. Um, in terms of what leads not only, and it's not, and this is not a matter for we're providing you professional advice on what our view is on whether we believe this is a performing service or otherwise. The evidence that we look at is, are they providing your audit to a, 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 an appropriate level of performance? We believe you are. they are. You as an audit committee and as members of our audit committee also need to make that judgment. And um, I, I'm providing, together with Ian Smith, our professional view on whether this is an adequate, um, a highly performing service that provides you a minimum amount of risk to move forward because the contract does allow an extension and that will always be um, the first option that we would look at. But um, I think it's a matter for the committee, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Any other questions? Okay, could, is there, does anybody else have any other questions other than Councillor Kane? <laughs> no, not at the moment. Okay, Councillor Kane. So, so, Chair, I, I would like it uh, minuted um, that uh, I've personally been very satisfied with the um, service provided by the current internal audit. However, what we're looking at now is not whether or not that service is good enough. We're looking at whether or not we should test whether it's giving us value for money. In other words, could we get a better, could we get the same service at a better price or could we get a better service at the same cost? That's in our financial procedures. I think we should follow our financial procedures. I think that this paper tells us that in terms of in-house, no, we wouldn't get um, better value for money. In terms of a full tendering with uh, private sector tenders, um, I think the answer is, the evidence here is no, we wouldn't get uh, value for money. I don't see that we've been given the evidence for that for the public sector providers. Um, and so I would like uh, more information uh, about the possible pro public sector advisors so we can satisfy ourselves whether or not uh, the current contract um, is a good one to extend if it will give us good value for money. Uh, so I would like to suggest uh, an amendment to the recommendation, which is delete recommendation 2.1 and replace with the report be noted and the committee agrees that little one, it would not be cost of... <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, and the committee agrees that little one 
it would not be cost effective to bring the internal audit service in house. Little two, a full tender exercise would be costly. and is unlikely to obtain either reduced cost or improved services at the same cost. And little three, the chief executive should bring a paper on the options for other public sector providers to the next meeting of this committee. Do you have a seconder for that? Yes. Thank you. Um, before we go on to that, I haven't had an opportunity to ask a question and I would like to, if I, if I may. I can... As a novice, I can totally understand how you can get contrary um, figures on tenders in terms of, of price. What I can't see is how, when we are pleased and satisfied with the service that we have, we would be able to prove or have evidence that another public service provider could provide something better. Cheaper, I could accept, Better, I can't see how that could be evidenced. And I would ask John, uh, 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 if we weren't, were to go through that person, what evidence could there be for, a, for a, when you've already satisfied yourself with what you have, and that has actually been minuted, that another provider could provide, could cheaper, but not necessarily better. I'm, I, I would like some clarification on that, please. I think what Councillor Kane is suggesting is a sort of informal market test. I'm looking for a nod yeah. from the... The amendments yeah um you you're absolutely right um and you will get prices although it's market testing in informal so there's always a caveat to that the only way that you you can try to provide or i could try to provide you confidence of levels of performance either the same or better um and that would again be very much weighing up the cost issue um, it would certainly be very difficult to provide an example of better, I think that's fair enough. But if in the example we came through, we had a public sector provider that was able to provide the service for less money, um, you would still, I would still need reinsurance before I recommend it to you that we go along with that alternative. And really, the only way that you can do that is that is provision of um, referee or um, with evidence from uh, providers who were receiving that service previously so one of the things i'd probably do is i'd go to local partners and all the rest of that but um um and use my network chief exec's network to try to do some work in that area um but it will never be a perfect answer to you and as a and i as i say to you chair it will take a lot in terms of a reduction in cost to then come back to you with a recommendation of changing your current provider because you are my recommendation to you is high performance good performance and it sounds like within the committee there's a general view of that um, as well so it will never be a perfect exercise and okay. i think we'll provide you with the same dilemma but we'll provide um, committee some clarification on the numbers but again, we'll be, we would be listening to your professional judgment on this. OK, we can go back to the uh, amendment. Is that your opening? Is, is that how you're going to talk to the amendment or did you want to say more? That's OK. I, I, I would just like to say a bit to the amendment very okay, quickly. Fine. But basically, it, we, we, are, we have in our financial procedures that we will seek value for money in our procurements. That, that means testing the market effectively. Um, and if, if we were to go down the route of saying, well, actually, if we think that the contractor is providing a good performance, we won't test the market. 
uh, that sends a very interesting message to our contractors. And we would, I suggest, need to change our financial procedures because that's not what we say in our financial procedures. Um, I think it's really important to test the market. Now, clearly, if we were unhappy with the service, we wouldn't bother with informal testing. We'd go out to full uh, procurement because we would hope to find somebody better. In, in this case, we are happy. So I think the sort of informal information we've had for bringing it in-house or for going out to full tender gives us sufficient information to say, you know what the market is. I don't think we've got that information yet for uh, other public sector providers. And I don't think we would be following our own financial procedures if we don't do that. Councillor Inscrip, you reserve the right to speak. Okay. Yes. Fine. Okay. Uh, are any other speakers on this? Yes. Um, I, I, I just, um, uh, again, um, it's for clarity, really, because at the beginning of this conversation, Councillor Payne was talking about uh, satisfaction of the service and uh, can we get, although it's good, can we get better? And then at the end of the conversation, Councillor Kane was talking about financial procedures and whether we can, whether it's right that we uh, don't go out to market to see if financially we can do better. They are two different things. And I'm not sure that option three gives you that second thing. So I don't think what the chief executive said is that he'll go out and ask other public sector providers to price the job. I think what he said was he'll, he'll use his network and get references to see it, you know, how the level of satisfaction. They are two different things. So I'm not sure that I'm not sure that's what's being offered is anything to do with our financial procedures because it's not about if the financial procedures are about value for money then what's being suggested isn't going to isn't going to prove that value for money so i just want clarity in case i've misunderstood that's all yeah i think we can provide clarity um we would do both i think um, is that we would there are ways of finding out what people are charging other people without going to a formal process. So much of this will be in the public domain. It will require some research, but we could do that. Um, I don't think at that stage we'd be going out, you know, taking any sort of formal references. But clearly, I'd be on the phone asking for some informal feedback. Um, that's if the amendment was carried. That's the way I would do it. I think. I have looked for clarity from the proposed the amendment, and I think that that's essentially my interpretation of the amendment should it be carried. So you will get some informal financial information. And if that informal information popped up someone who was, could provide that service at or below the current service within realms, I think then I'd be looking for more quality, quantity, qualitative info, um, information from the the current council receiving that service. Because there's a, there are providers out there, as we know. Any more? We're debating at the moment. Yes, Council Shaw. Yes, I, I, I think it's, mm -hmm. it, it's not a question of money because um, you, you wouldn't necessarily, in this instance, certainly, well, I wouldn't um, take the cheapest option because that may not necessarily be the best. And it's a question of how difficult it's going to be to get um, assurance or information, is probably the better word, on how good or bad other providers are. Um, it's a very specialist area. Um, and yeah, I take the point that yes, we've got to be looking all the time for, you know, to make sure we've got value for money. but. On this what on this sort of instance, I, I'm a bit um, I'm not clear that we ne necessarily going down that route would actually provide that. Um, I'm not sure what else we could add at this stage. Okay, is your hand up again? Yeah. Okay. Yes, Councillor. 
Thank you. Thank you for um, further clarifying, John. Um, more really on Councillor Sharp's point, I think that's also where I'm going, is that value for money isn't just about money, is it? And so it's very difficult outside of a full procurement exercise. And after all, procurement is carefully designed and scored in order to see things as a whole. And so without the benefit of a full procurement exercise, I'm not sure that we can be really seeking value for money properly um, because it's about so much more than either the service or the money. It's about the whole thing, isn't it? And so I, I suppose the thing that really got my attention was Councillor Kane's reference to our own financial procedures, because of course I wouldn't want us to fall outside of those. But I'm not sure if in fact we are, because it's about value for money, not just money or not just the service. And so I think there is a subtlety to, to the wording of those procedures or the spirit of those procedures, which is beyond um, what Councillor Kane was suggesting. And, that, and so I'm less convinced that we're, we're in any way breaking or, or moving away from our own procedures by not doing what's being suggested by the amendment. I, I, I think it's more subtle than that. Sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry. You're seconding. Are you seconding now? You're not part of the debate, obviously, because you're seconding. So are you seconding now? I can do if that's if that's if useful. That's, no, I, I, that's, I was just, just unclear that from Councillor no, so can you Councillor Schumann how he was looking for value for money because he he seemed to think that it was important to say. So this isn't a discussion across the floor here. So uh, um, no, I'm, 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 I was second. I thought second, you called me to second, and now you've been talking over me. I'm a little bit unclear. You're not seconding at this moment. You talk. You are, are you telling me or are you asking? No, I'm asking you. So I are as, you as I said about I don't it, seem to have so, any more questions from the, the floor other than your saying. So if you're happy to second now, that's great. Yeah, so I was unclear from Councillor Schumann's comments how he was he seemed to want to stay within the in the within the spirit of our financial regulations, which say that we we seek value for money in all procurement activity. So, so I think the spirit is, is clear that we seek value for money and the scope is, is at all activities. He then seemed to, to, to be suggesting that, if I understood correctly, that uh, option, I'm not sure if he was arguing for option, he couldn't be arguing for option one because that doesn't look at other possible providers. I'm not there for sure if he was arguing for option four, uh, but 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 for me, it's it's very clear that you know as an audit committee, we uh, amongst any other committee need to be uh, showing that we are taking proper heed of uh, of the financial regulations, uh, and that's something that I feel is, is very important to me, which which is why I'm I'm seconding this this amendment. We know because we've already had that. The, the question answered that we've not to date no work has been done to look at whether there are any other public sector providers who could potentially offer any sort of service so we have zero information on alternatives those alternatives could be cheaper they could be the same cost but to give us a better service we just don't know and if we don't propose this amendment and we just go with with option one we're not looking for value for money in this particular procurement activity. We're just making a, a decision based on, on uh, an information of comparison with one, with the in-house option, but not looking at all, any of those possible uh, external options. I would feel very uncomfortable to follow that approach because I would feel as a member of this committee, I, I wasn't following either the letter or even the spirit of those financial regulations. Thank you. We don't go back to the proposal in, uh, in an amendment, so we'll go straight for the vote. Could I ask for a recorded vote, please? Yes, of course. Yes. 
So those, uh, the, oh, I, I can't possibly read out that recommendation because would you mind reading it out again? Yes. Thank you. Okay, so the amendment is to delete the existing 2.1 and replace it with the report be noted and the committee agrees that little one, it will not be cost effective to bring the internal audit service in house. Little two, a full tender exercise would be costly and is unlikely to obtain either reduced costs or improved services at the same cost. Little three, that the chief executive bring a paper on other on the other option for public sector providers to the next meeting of the committee. Thank you very much indeed. So in that case, can you take a recorded vote, Tracy? I can. Sorry, Chair, can I just correct? It's the chief executive should bring a paper on the options for other public sector providers. Yep, okay, that's fine. Yep. So when I call your name, can you say whether you're voting for, against, or abstaining on the amendment? Councillor Kane. For. Councillor Every. Against. Councillor Inskip. For. Councillor Dan Schumann. Against. Councillor Alan Sharp. Against. So the amendment is lost by three votes to two. But in that case, we return to the original recommendation. Thank you very much, which is uh, members are requested to extend the current partnership and delegation agreement with North Northamptonshire Council from April 2024 until March 2027. Uh, proposer, uh, Councillor Sharp, do you want to speak? Or do we, do we need to go straight to the vote? No, I'm not. Okay. So I reserve the right to speak. Any debate on this? Yes, Councillor McCain. Uh, I, I would like a recorded vote on this one as well. I would just remind the members of the committee that our financial procedures are very clear. The council seeks value for money in all procurement activity. This means obtaining either better prices or improved services for the same cost. This paper shows that we can't do that by bringing the internal audit in-house. It would cost significantly more and not be as resilient a service. We probably can't do it by going to a full tender because we've seen some indicative prices that suggest that would come in significantly more expensive and frankly, quite probably uh, not as good. However, we do not have evidence on the public sector provider. In fact, we have clearly been told by the chief executive that he hasn't done any investigation as to whether there would be another public sector provider. I will not be voting for this motion because I believe it is against this council's financial procedures. Okay, I'm not going to speak. Anybody else need want to speak? Yes, Councillor Inskip. Yes, no, I'd just like to make it clear as well, as I've, um, I'm absolutely clear that if we were to go ahead and vote on the recommendation, that in my mind, we're, we're not adhering to that key financial regulation. Uh, and as a member of the, this authority and of the audit committee, I take that responsibility to follow the financial regulations uh, seriously. And I would hope that other members would, would feel the same and respect those regulations. Okay, so we, can we go to the vote now? Recorded vote, does Councillor Kane suggest? Request, rather. So we're now voting. Sorry, sorry, can I just check? Would this be a named recorded vote? I want it to ensure that my name votes. shows that yeah. I voted recorded against Recorded votes are always named. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, and if it's recorded That's vote, you always have to put the names in. Okay, so this is on the recommendation. Um, can, when I call your name, can you say whether you're voting for, against, or abstaining? Councillor Kane. Against. Councillor Every. For. Councillor Inskip. Against. Councillor Dan Schumann. For. Councillor Alan Sharp. For. So the recommendation is carried by three votes to two. Thank you very much indeed. Okay. Uh, we could actually bring Rachel back in now, if, 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 although she's not on yet for, until, for the next one. So, um, yes.
So we're moving on to agenda item number seven. Um, and this is the draft annual governance uh, statement, which we are asked, the committee's asked to consider if the AGS is consistent with their own perspective on internal control within the council, plus the governance issues and actions. Do we have a proposer, please? I'm happy to propose. Second. Proposed by uh, Councillor Schumann, seconded by uh, Councillor Sharp. Um, so, it, uh, John, if you would like to. Uh, to uh, Thank you, Chairman. I, I suspect um, we may need to revisit that recommendation as the committee um, comes to a view on various issues. But, um, and it, it's vague in by respect that it shows that we're at very much at the first stage of this process. This is the very much the first draft of the annual governance statement. And I think um, the discussion, not to put words into members' minds, I think the discussion today is as much about process moving forward and how we want to involve all members of the committee's views in terms of um, bringing a further draft statement back to you. Um, it, you do have the full opportunity to come back to your next committee for me to present a revised draft um, and I think it's a question today, Chair, is how do, the, how do members of the committee want to take both the formal processes forward and the informal processes forward to, to provide their views either as a collective in this committee or as individuals into what will become the next draft for this committee? When you do look at it again, I think you'll be asked to um, agree a draft to be recommended to the myself and to the leader to sign. Um, but rather than go through all the detail of it, and um, that's very much the draft, I think um, I think you have a number of options, Chair. Um, obviously, if you're absolutely satisfied with the documents as currently drafted, you can very easily take that view. And I think by um, slightly tweaking the recommendation, you can say, yes, it is consistent, and we are agreed, and that's the... The, the end of the process and this is, becomes the final that is signed off by myself as Chief Executive of the Leaders of the Council. Um, we, we, I suspect um, there are views that yeah. to improve the document. Um, we hope we've reflected some of the previous discussions we had this time uh, previously on the last government statement and have improved that statement from the last time. So you, I think you've got, you, you could do both, Chairman. You could obviously have a debate today. And if there is um, either a consensus or majority to move ahead with certain instructions to myself as the author to make certain amendments, or we could agree that we have a informal mechanism by which individual members can submit their individual views to myself as the author within the time frame, and then I could come back to your next committee with a revised draft indicating whether I've incorporated those and the reasons for not incorporating them, and then the committee can take a view on the final draft. Well, we so, can manage the recommendation as we go, can't we? So I, I absolutely... Uh, so I'm I don't sure think I want to add any more at the moment, yeah. Chairman. I'm sure you're, probably your latter view would be the one that people will want to, to take into uh, account. We don't have any tabled questions, so we've had no responses that are written. Uh, so now, really, it's a question of asking questions of uh, John. Uh, he's put, He suggested that, that we, we look at it from the perspective of perspective that, it, that we're satisfied with this. I can't not sure that that is ever going to be the way it is such in that way but this does it has given us the option as this is the first draft not only to give our views in this committee but to also give our views uh, outside this committee which will then come back to us as it's the second draft or the final do we have would we have a, a timeline for that actually i was just looking for that on the would it be the next meeting in january that yes yeah and we will reflect um a timeline of when I've had discussions with the lead officer and yourself yeah. with respect to providing members. Out. But we do have some time here. Yeah. Um, OK, so well, let's use this time wisely then. This is an opportunity for uh, members to ask questions if they want or make comments that obviously will be uh, minuted, that, which will help John uh, with this process going forward. So do we have any comments? <laughs> OK. 
um, first of all, thank you for the table. Um, it, it's on the way to what I asked for, but you won't be surprised to hear. Uh, uh, I, I would I would prefer um, a little more honesty. I don't mean that it's dishonest. I mean uh, transparency about things that maybe haven't worked as well um, as they should have done. Um, I, I think um, the discussion we had on the previous item would suggest to me that uh, there needs to be uh, better training and dissemination of uh, our financial procedures if we're going to say that we have strong public financial management. Um, so uh, maybe you might want to think about that. Um, the fundamental problem I have with it is how this audit committee runs because Throughout the paper, there are quite a few references to the audit committee um, uh, in, in, the, in the context of the audit committee providing um, some comfort um, that the governance is being managed well. And I'm not sure this audit committee, as it is constituted, uh, is able to do that. Um, you will know uh, I have not been happy with the terms of reference and with the fact that uh, against best practice, we're not allowed to ask uh, officers uh, or uh, senior members to appear here and explain um, decision making, <coughs> risk, risk analysis, whatever it might be. Um, and I think that makes us a very weak audit committee so I don't think we're providing the comfort for the governance statement that uh, the reference to us in here would suggest and and I think I would specifically pick out the the risk register um, we've expressed concerns about the risk management process and the risk register pretty much since we started work um, and, and yet, you know, there are references to us reviewing it regularly, but not references to the fact that when we have re reviewed it, we have made it clear that we're not happy with it. Um, so I, I think we need to find a way um, to, to be more open about the fact that the audit committee is is, is not delivering what people might expect an audit committee would deliver because we're not following normal and, and best practice. Um, and then there's other things. It, it talks about um, an all member shareholder seminar on page 21 um, and that that happens um, at the end of each financial year. Well, the, the shareholder meeting this year was delayed from May to July, because the business plans were unavailable, and then from July to September, because some of the directors and the council's Section 151 officer wasn't available. Um, so it, it, it implies that there's a, a, a process there that is, is working when actually it isn't. And further up on the page, at the top of the page, it talks about um, the shareholder committee being um, the, the um, finance committee and that it approves the business plan for 2022-23. And then in brackets, it says June 2022. So what that's actually saying is that the business plan for 2022-23 was not approved before the start of the new financial year. Um, which is a more transparent way to, to explain it, because that's a problem, that's a fault. We were a quarter of the way into the new year before we saw the business plan, and we had this slightly strange um, explanation that for that first quarter of the 2022-23 financial year, they were operating on the 2021-2022 budget and business plan, which is... A, a very odd statement. Um, so I, I think we should be more transparent in here that yes, in theory, these things happen, but in practice, 
uh, they're not happening as they should do. Want to come back on that? Jim? I'm not sure it was a question, Chair, rather the statement, but what I would say, and um, you, I know you've had discussions in this committee about the role of this committee in relation to the companies, and uh, what, again, apologies on putting words in your mind, because I'm trying to make everything help assist me in redrafting. I think what Councillor Kane is saying to me, and please say, for, is that it's, this is not about this committee being the shareholder committee for the council in relation to its companies, but what I think Councillor Kane is saying, by virtue that the timetable is not being adhered to, that that is a concern for this committee. And I think that's what I can take away and to see whether I can provide more effective assurance and guarantees to this committee that in the future timetables are appropriate and are kept. And I was almost saying it's a legitimate discussion and, and I don't want to lose the point because is that fair, uh, Councillor Kane? That, that's a significant part because that takes us forward to the future. But in terms of what it actually says in this governance statement, yeah. I don't think that is transparent and honest because it, it implies that approving the business plan in June was okay when actually it wasn't that's not our procedures we didn't follow our procedures the finance and assets committee should have approved the business plan before the start of the new financial year Other, otherwise you, you're not providing any kind of control or governance i'm happy to take that point away yes. and look at the wording of that and um whether I can be more transparent and open, because I think it's a fair challenge, yeah. and try to provide, and I think it is important to look forward as backwards, and try and provide this committee with an assurance on the timetable, its effectiveness in, in undertaking your function as an audit committee. Yes, yeah. yeah, so if I may say, so obviously there's no point in having a timetable unless we work to it, and, uh, and that's, I think, what we're trying to do is to get to get a government statement where we know we are working to those, those uh, timers. I mean, sometimes some things will go yeah. wrong, and, and there's, I mean, nobody expected COVID for a start. It's those things, but if this is what we're working towards, then it gives the audit committee the opportunity to question yes. when we don't. Absolutely, Chairman, and I think, um, oh, sorry, I, I was going to say, and when they do go wrong, we should be honest about it in yes, the governance statement. I, yeah. I think that was exactly what I was about to say. I need to reflect on whether that narrative properly appropriate, appropriately reflects on what actually happened in that particular year, and perhaps revisit the reasons why it didn't, but again, try and provide you better assurance in the future. I mean, looking generally, uh, obviously, it's a it's a large document and it covers a lot of areas and, and so on. And Councillor Kane has just been able to identify one of those areas. I'm I'm suspecting that there will be other areas that people will want to make some comment on, either here or outside this meeting. Any comments more for this meeting, Councillor Inskip first? <laughs> Yeah, just on the, the point of transparency, I think there's a couple of other things that, again, you, you could read this in, in a different way. So, uh, so if I go to page three, uh, where it talks about in 2021, a full review of the contracts, um, council's contracts register was conducted led by uh, legal uh, services and finance to ensure all contracts were suitably captured. Now, you might read that and think, oh, well, that, that was fine. That, all, that was all well and good. What we actually found was that there were a number of issues there that needed to be resolved. And so I think a more accurate statement would be to identify that and, and, and talk about the, the then subsequent actions that were taken uh, to resolve that. Uh, and, and another example, I think on page uh, eight, no, well, if I got to page four, um, we're talking about uh, um, the sort of contract procedure rules and so on, and we had the issue around and the um, the relevant requirements and uh, uh, an exercise uh, due controls. Uh, again, I remember the issue coming up about uh, the um, the approval of invoices over fifty thousand pounds. So again, we had an issue. I, I believe the right actions have been taken, although I think there was still a there was not a systematic, let's say, way of solving that. It still relies on a manual check, but, but at least an issue has been identified, and I believe actions are, take, are taken to address it. But we don't 
we don't mention that. Um, so it's it's yeah that I'm sure that came out as part of ensuring whether uh, uh, whether service leads and staff were were exercising those controls properly. So John's obviously picked up requests. And are there any more? Sorry, Charlotte, you said you. I think you put your hand up again. I'm sorry. Any more comments? Because I'm, I appreciate that we've sort of, pardon the expression, cherry picked bits out of this, and and that and this document is uh, needs to be uh, uh, more carefully scrutinised. Um, so we we haven't gone to recommendation which said this is fine. <laughs> so we're obviously going to the recommendation which says uh, we we need to provide you with more information. Uh, John, could you tell us how you would like us to to do this? Because obviously we're working back from January. Uh, we have Christmas in the middle, but also uh, you've got uh, other things to do. How would you like the committee uh, to to respond to you uh, in more detail? Um, obviously, the comments that have been made today, I will take back yeah, of course. and reflect that back in a response in the in the next draft document. And I've noted them, and I'm sure Tracy's done a much better job than I have noting those. Um, I think it, I could probably best answer the question almost by suggesting a draft, uh, a new recommendation. recommendation. I thought you might. Yep. Yes. <laughs> um, that the chief exec report back to the next committee with the revised draft of governance statement and puts in place a process to invite members to provide input and comments within a, a suitably agreed timetable in consultation with the chairman. Okay. Did you get, was I going too quick? Did you get that? Yeah, and put in place a process to invite members to provide input and comments within an agreed timetable in consultation with the chair of the committee. <laughs> Sorry, put in place a process to invite members to provide input stroke comments within a suitable timetable agreed in consultation with the chair. So, um, if everybody's in agreement with that, I think we could just move on because uh, I have to say it was unusual wording asking us to consider. <laughs> I don't think we've seen that before. So if everybody's happy with that re uh, revised recommendation, that means that you will all have time to to make your own uh, uh, amendments put forward and and obviously also have time to discuss it with others if you if you wish. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, John. So we're moving on to agenda um, item number eight where we do have questions, um, but this is, uh, uh, this is the anti-fraud and corruption strategy um, and the recommendation for this, uh, it's going to be introduced by, uh, by Ian, but members are asked to recommend to full council the adoption of the updated anti-fraud corruption strategy as attached in, in appendix one to this report. And as it's a recommendation, I will need a proposer and a seconder, please. Do I have a proposer? And a seconder? So, uh, Ian, could you uh, speak to? Thank you, Chair. This policy was last reviewed three years ago, though has been updated when necessary over the summer. Members are asked to recommend to full council the approval of the updated document. Thank you. Okay, sorry, took my pen broke in the middle of that. Uh, so thank you, Ian. So uh, obviously uh, we did have some uh, written questions. Thank you, uh, Charlotte. Um, sorry? There were, oh, sorry. I, the, yes, there was just one question which has been, which has been, does anybody else have any other questions? That they, are you, first of all, were you happy with the answer to that question that you put in? I can't remember it. <laughs> said appendix one part of the definition of fraud seems to be very narrow where it's <laughs> okay so if you're happy with that are there any other questions that um, you would like to raise for uh, uh council shop just um certainly just one initial point um and it's obviously a subject that um a, a lot of thoughts given to now is in terms of the anti-money laundering statement is that compliant with current obviously the practice is changing all the time uh, is that as far as you're aware Ian you know sort of up to date in terms of legislation and I'm not saying it isn't I, you know 
to my best of my knowledge, that is up to date. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yes, that's okay. So um, I I think the um, definition of uh, that we've got in here for fraud is is a narrow definition. Um, I I disagree that it's uh, um, covers different type of frauds. Um, it's not just about uh, financial statements, and it's not just about um, gain. It can be fraud to uh, mislead, um, to uh, try and hide for potential problems. Um, so I, I would like to see um, a, a review of the de definition of fraud. So it, it covers more things. Um, at 1.7, uh, there's a list of, of, of frauds. I would have thought one of the biggest frauds, uh, well, one of the frauds that could have had the biggest impact on us uh, would, would be uh, fraudulent financial reporting. Um, now, I'm obviously not suggesting this is happening, but were the trading companies to try and hide a problem with their financial reporting, uh, that would be quite serious for us. So. I, I think that should be in there, I, I, and I think it should be, it, it, it's not just about uh, individual gain, uh, fraud is, is, is wider than that. Um, I, on on uh, 5.4, um, it, it talks about the levels of fraud that would get reported to external audit, uh, and it says all frauds involving sums over 10k. That seems quite high to me. Um, and also I wasn't clear from this whether that would be, we'd notify them when there was a suspicion of a fraud of that amount or when we had uh, proved that there was a fraud of, of that amount. Um, I, I wonder if we should be um, reporting all frauds to our external auditors because they could indicate a wider problem with our controls. Uh, but if we felt that that was potentially too much, should we consider frauds by employees or members uh, as something? Because that would suggest um, in, internal problems that you would want the external auditor uh, to be aware of and, and look at. Um, then I, I, I had trouble with the actual policy statements as to um, exactly how they were written and how they were consistent. So uh, we've got a anti-fraud um, anti -fraud strategy, uh, but a bribery policy statement. Um, and um, I would have thought we're anti-bribery as well. We have references to them that sometimes include, uh, make clear that they are also relevant for members, but often don't. Um, so in the uh, first page of the Bribery Act, it says we require that all employees, including those permanently employed, temporary agency staff and contractors to act honestly and so forth. I, I would have thought members should be um, listed there as, as well. Um, and. I, I'm, there doesn't seem to be consistency about whether we have a nominated officer. So we do have a nominated officer um, for um, anti-money laundering, but not, I don't think, for bribery or for anti-fraud. Um, and yes, the whistleblowing is good and it should always be there and people should use it. But I think it's also good to have a, a nominated officer that people uh, know they can report to. Um, I don't understand why anyone who has questions about these policies should refer those to internal audit. These are our policies. So I would have expected uh, any questions about them to be referred uh, to the relevant um, member of staff, maybe the, the nominated person. Um, and, and it says, if bribery is reported, we will act as soon as possible. That seems very vague to me. Um, I, I don't really know 
uh, what it means. I also, perhaps I just missed it, but I, I couldn't see in, in the bribery report that it's really important that people report any attempt at bribery, whether it's successful or not. Um, so if, if somebody uh, attempts to bribe me, I should report that uh, even though obviously I wouldn't have accepted the bribe. Um, and I wasn't sure, maybe I missed it, but I wasn't sure if that was ex explicit in, in the report. So I, I think um, they're, they're on the way, but I don't personally feel that they're yet ready uh, to take to council. Do you want to respond again? Or... Oh, Sorry, Dan, do you want to come back on that before? Yeah. Um, may I just ask Councillor Kane yes, a question? Because well, um, your, your first um, concern and the concern that you submitted the question about was regarding the definition of fraud that's used. I'm just not clear why, that, why the definition of fraud is a concern. Um, it's a genuine question. I just don't understand why why you're so concerned about how fraud is defined that's could you just enlighten me on that yeah uh, so so chair i'm i'm not i'm not entirely clear of the process here um in an earlier item you um wouldn't let mm -hmm. councillor inskip ask questions so. okay that's fine if, if you don't want to answer my no, question I'm, councillor not, Kane, I'm, you don't have to I'm answer. very you're happy right. to answer it. i did ask the chairman's permission yeah. first yeah, but you're right okay in which case i'm very happy to answer the question no, i apologize to councillor inskip yeah no but i but why because if you haven't defined what the policy is about, then how can the policy work? Okay, so it's about enforcement of the policy, ultimately. It's about how it's about the, the definition of fraud enables us to trigger the policy or not trigger the policy. Well, it's 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 an anti-fraud policy. So we have to know what fraud is in order to know what we're anti. Okay, thank you for that clarification, in which case I, can, I, I will now make my point, which is I, I, I think that Councillor Kane's fear over the definition of fraud is unfounded um, and, and I, I, I don't share, having heard the reason for it, I don't share the same fear and the, and the reason I don't share the same fear is because actually the Fraud Act does really carefully and clearly define fraud. And so our policy making reference to the Fraud Act and reference to the three types of fraud, which have been thoroughly covered by enormous amounts of case law, if you want to take the time to read around it, i.e. fraud by uh, false representation, failing to disclose and abuse of position. Uh, there, I don't think that there is any question over the, the definition of fraud. And I think there is enough surrounding case law that, um, either covers our our interpretation or failing our interpretation fraud is a criminal offense regardless of our policy and so it would be covered by the fraud act which has further definitions which are in any case referenced in ours so i i really i think unless councillor kane wants to you know go all the way through the high court and re uh, debate what fraud means I don't think there's a problem with the definition because I think it's covered in law again and again and again. And those of us that have studied law will know that inside out and backwards. And those of us that don't can find out when the time comes. So I, I really don't think that that's, that that's an issue. So thank you for clarifying because that's what I suspected. Um, also, I don't think it's an issue that members, the word members isn't specifically flagged in this policy because Again, the Bribery Act, the Fraud Act, all of those acts, anything in statute covers us all, member or not member. And so, you know, even if, the, if, even if the policy doesn't make it explicit, the policy does make explicit that it operates within the statute that's out there. And the statute that's out there is equally as relevant to everybody in every walk of life, member or not member. 
whether the word is there or, t or it isn't, by virtue of the fact that we're a human being, we're covered by it. Um, if we're operating within England and Wales, which we are. So I don't think that that's an issue either. I do think that as soon as possible, um, I, I accept there is some ambiguity around that. As soon as practicable would be better, I think, because I suspect that the reason for as soon as possible is because sometimes there are steps to take before uh, you then activate the policy or use the policy or decide what how to use the policy. Um, so I'd be more comfortable with as soon as practicable, but, you know, I, I, I don't, it's not for me a, a, a deal breaker, but I, I do see some, some, I have some sympathy with the view that that's not, it's a bit woolly, uh, but as soon as practicable, I would, I would move uh, to as a, a better alternative wording. Um, so given all of that and that they, uh, the substantial concerns that Councillor Kane had, are actually covered by really rigorous statute that's out there that this policy operates within in any case. Um, I, 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 I don't share the same concern. Okay, we're still in questions. Yes, Councillor Inskip. So it doesn't sound like a question, it's more like a, a statement from, uh, from Councillor Schumann. Um, I'll ask a question then. Um, Given that under Section 7 of the Bribery Act 2010, uh, there's a corporate offence of a failure of an organisation to prevent bribery, is it sufficient to say bribery is illegal and therefore if people uh, are found guilty of it, they, they, you know, they've committed a crime? Or do we have to make sure that we have robust procedures in place in order to, to be compliant with Section 7 of the, of the Act? So are these procedures that support the policy are outside the policy, presumably, are they? Yeah. Uh, so there are, so what was, so are we saying that actually the procedures, which wouldn't be included necessarily in the policy, because obviously implementation of the policy is usually outside that, are there, you're, what you're <laughs> suggesting is that are there robust, is there, there's just not in this policy statement? If, I'm sorry. No, so, so, um, so Councillor Schumann was um, in in his comments. He 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 talked about bribery being illegal, and, and therefore it, it didn't really uh, you know matter what the council did because it it was illegal anyway, and, and people would be found uh, could be charged for that. I put I my question was my understanding is under Section Seven of the Bribery Act, uh, there's a corporate offence. Uh, uh, and a failure by a commercial organisation to, pre to prevent bribery. And in order to avoid uh, being charged with that corporate offence, uh, the defence would be that you've got an appropriate bribery policy in place and that you have appropriately enforced it. And that was my, uh, my, my question was, is my understanding correct? It's, it's about procedures then. In the strategy. To, to be perfectly honest, my my knowledge of the Bribery Act is probably no greater than anybody else in this room, and so I need to clarify that. Right. Well, if I could just clarify again. But um, sorry, I, I I do think, in answer to the question, I do think there are things in place that we have lots of things in place that prevent just bribery. <laughs> Not, you know, one of them is just is. The declaration of interest, you know, there's lots of things in place. So it the answer is yes, there are. Where, you know, where if Councillor Inskip's question is, are there enough? That's a different question. But I think there definitely are, and we all take part in them. Councillor Kane. Uh yes, could could I ask um Ian? Um given given the uh fraud and bribery and money laundering laundering are illegal, why do we bother with a policy? I think we're required to have one. I mean, all, I mean, clearly I take your point that these are things which are illegal, but you know, clearly the, the council and indeed all councils will have a 
policy on on such matters in, in what we what you have in front of you is is consistent with what other councils have have as well so you know it's 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 just a statement of where the council council believes its position is or the council's position is with regard to bribery and anti-corruption and, and it's something which obviously therefore we have in our constitution which highlights it to to members and officers that we do take this seriously and 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 are looking for and and we um investigating where we think there are issues that need need to be just Need to be investigated so if i may just interject there that so yes we do have legal requirements and we're all subject to the law this document and strategy document is the one that goes to the full council that explains to our members exactly how this is going to be the, str the strategy which supports the legal framework happens okay um i think ian and um, alan's wanting to ask a question So uh, what we have established, which doesn't surprise me, is that we are required to have the policies, despite the fact that there is uh, a legal fr framework behind them. We are required to have them, and therefore they must be robust. And I do not think these are yet sufficiently robust to take to full council. Hello. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm... Mike's gone off. Because um, looking at the, and I know Councillor Kane touched on it, um, looking at the wording in terms of definition of fraud. Now, I, I'm looking online at the, the current policy that's on, and that came from the Audit Commission, that wording, because I, I was intrigued as to where that had come from. Um, and the Audit Commission hasn't existed for about the last, God knows how many years, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, 10 years, certainly. Um, yes, at least, probably. Um, so I, I've got, um, I can understand the Bribery Act, the, the anti-money laundering items. You know, I asked that question because I've seen those policies till they're coming out of my ears in terms of that. And I just wanted to make sure I, I hadn't sort of missed anything that it didn't comply with current legislation. You know, it wasn't picking up all the bits of current legislation and practice. But... The, the policy that's on the website is saying that it was published in October 2008. So obviously, I'm presuming that's the one that's currently in in place. Um, so in 14 years, I, I can and and I can look at it. A lot of it, this is just taken straight from that old policy, which is some of those bits not a problem. But there may be, and I, I think you know. I, I'm sympathising with the, the fact that we maybe need to tidy it up a, a, little, a bit before we put it forward, but, um, but am, I, am I correct in that, um, Ian, that, that it's, you know, the, the current sure. policy is 2008, certainly that's one on the website. I'm not sure what your definition is, tidied up a bit. It, is that your, the, the version that's in the Constitution is much later than 2008, so I'm assuming you're finding a web page which is very out of date because the version in the constitution is certainly only less than a year old. <laughs> okay, thank you. That, that's what was worrying me, because I thought, yeah, that's the reason. Okay, thank you. Dan, so hand. Um, I just wanted to make a point of clarification, really. I did not say that the policy, that, that, that these policies don't have to be robust or whatever it was that Councillor Kane just uh, said. What what I'm trying to say is that there is a difference between the parts of the policy which are purely our policy and the parts of the policy which are in fact covered by law. And we have to worry less about, for instance, the definition of fraud because the definition of fraud is covered by law. There are parts of the policy which fall outside of the, the Fraud Act or the Bribery Act or any act because statute is overarching policy is these policies are specific to our organization and specific to our circumstances etc cetera, etc cetera. so of course there are parts of the policy that that we need to be satisfied are robust and right for us my point was that the parts that councillor kane had pulled out as her concern don't need to be 
because they're covered by law. So things like definitions of fraud, things like who falls within the scope of the policy should a fraudulent act take place, are covered by the law. And those laws are quoted within the policies and the policies operate within the law. So all I was trying to do is create a, um, a, a, create a, a, a difference between the way that we look at these policies in that some parts of it are enshrined in law, covered by law, covered by case law, much more substantial than one might think on the page and therefore are less of a concern to me because other areas of our life pick up where the policy leaves off. And then there are areas of the policy which are operational or specific to us, which of course need to be robustly specific to us. But there is a difference when you look at these documents and that difference is important. It just so happens that two of the three things that Councillor Kane raised, I believe, fall into one category. The other one, I said, and still you know, believe, the third one, the as soon as possible, perhaps doesn't. And so maybe I agree, does need to be sharper. So I hope, I, I just wanted to clarify that because I think it's an important definition because it's a different way of looking at the same thing. If I may just say something, we are not being very helpful to our officer here because this is just discussion going backwards and forwards. And if we are going to tidy things up a bit, um, we need to know exactly what our instructions would be in order to manage that process. And I have, I'm have i not finding clarity here of, of what that would look like. And that's not being very helpful to, to our officer, if I may say so, Councillor Kane. Uh, so just to clarify something that was said earlier, uh, Councillor Sharp thought perhaps um, the uh, policy dated back to 2008 uh, he was corrected and told it was about a year old. I think the paper tells us that it was 2019 when the last policy was approved. Um, so um, taking what um, Councillor Schumann says, I, I think you have possibly two options with um, an internal policy. You either refer direct to the relevant act so you would say something like the definition of fraud is laid out in the fraud act section whatever um or you have a definition that is a sound and good definition now my view is you have to do the latter because most of the staff and the members and the contractors and the agency staff will not have read the Bribery Act and the Anti-Fraud Act, etc. They need to have a clear idea of what this policy is trying to prevent and how they might participate in preventing it. Um, so I think it's important that there are clear definitions. I think it is important that there is clarity about what happens if I report a suspected fraud or bribery? What's the next step? You know, um, within two weeks, something will happen or whatever. Um, just as soon as possible or as soon as practicable. You know, that's kind of, I'm really busy, so I'll do it in a week or two. Meanwhile, potentially, uh, the, the damage has been done, the evidence has been lost, whatever. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm not able, I don't think it's right for a committee to rewrite the papers. No. Um, I've, I've given some general overview as, as to what I think. And I personally would, would like uh, this committee to ask the officer to, <laughs> to go back um, and, and review um, the paper. I mean, for an example, Councillor Sharp asked, for, asked a very straightforward question about whether the policy here was uh, for, I think it was the bribery one, I can't remember which one. The money laundering, the money laundering was, was in, in, in line with the latest guidance and we were told that um, the officer wasn't sure. Well, we need to be sure before we send this to council. 
Um, so I, I just I think there should be more work done on it and then it can come back to this committee again. Uh, and obviously it has to go to council. We need council uh, to understand and buy in to this policy. But it's really important that it's one that all our staff and, and members and so forth can understand it and participate in it because it's obviously none of us want this council to suffer from uh, or be involved in in any way fraud money laundering or bribery and that means having really good clear robust policies these aren't bad i'm not saying they're bad i'm just saying they could be a lot better and they should be a lot better before we send them to council councillor inskip uh, thank, thank you, Chair. So just to add uh, some of the, the concerns that, that I have, again, I don't think it's up to us as members to rewrite the policies, uh, but if I look at the, the, uh, uh, the uh, Bribery Act policy statement, it, it says uh, towards the end there's a section on staff responsibilities, uh, and, and it, it talks about... Um, uh, you must ensure that you've read, understood and complied with this policy, raise concerns as soon as possible if you believe or suspect that a conflict with the policy has occurred. I, I think we need to be stronger in terms of how we ensure that that happens, because it will see later on when we come to the audit, in, in certain areas we're very poor at following up on, on requirements that we place on, on staff uh, and members. Uh, and it's no good having a, a bribery policy if it's not read. Um, you know, I, in my day job, I have to once a year prove that I've read the Bribery Act and the, the system we use forces me to actually read the, the material on the Bribery Act. I can't skip it and tick a box. I have to do it. It's not the most exciting bit of my job. And there's a number of other uh, legal um, uh, requirements on, 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 on some of the other aspects we're dealing with here uh and on data protection and so on as well that all gets monitored and every member of staff every, absolutely every member of staff has to do that on an annual basis we have nothing here that says how we're going to to do that uh in, in terms of our own uh, bribery policy but that looks pretty good to me when i then turn to the the anti uh money uh, laundering policy statement because in the uh, if I look at the bribery one, it talks about the scope in terms of it applies to all employees. It doesn't mention members. It says employees, those permanently employed, temporary agency staff and contractors. Um, we have had, it says we're talking about employees and agency workers in, um, uh, in the uh, money laundering. So, so we have a slightly different definition of the applicability as to um, in this case. And it, it isn't clear to me why those two aren't uh, aren't consistent. Again, it doesn't have, uh, whereas the bribery policy has a very clear statement on staff responsibilities. Um, it, there's a, something about, it talks about the council ob obligations, uh, but it doesn't talk about the uh, any requirements, as far as I can see it, of, of staff to have um, uh, read this, um, read this policy statement so so why does different guidance apply to this than to the um bribery one or, or is it simply that two different people wrote the two different uh policies so i think there's a need to, to come out with some more consistency and to ensure that we've got a robust way of ensuring that uh all those who uh, uh, who need to comply with these policies are uh are fully aware of the um of that need to to comply and we've got a, a clear record that they have that they have uh, they have read the the relevant guidance that we provide. Right. So, uh, Councillor Sharp, you've recommended this. Or are you suggesting that we change the recommendation? I think so. I think there, there are certain. Yeah. 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 So would you like to say, I mean, I've written down a number of issues, but I've tried to keep up with him. Yeah, no, uh, well, if I could just reiterate the things that I've loosely picked up that people have suggested. One, of course, was the, the full statement of the definition. Uh, named, identified named managers for each of the areas. 
that Councillor Kane brought out, whether there's some and not others. There was a mention of whether we felt that uh, on page nine, that uh, the, the 10,000 um, pounds was an appropriate amount um, before it goes, before it's raised before the um, uh, uh, external auditor. Uh, staff responsibilities and procedures are other things that have been added to make it clearer to make sure that staff and members understand what their role is and what they are expected to, to do. Now, I'm pretty sure, I'm sure that if I asked all the managers, they would all know what those procedures were, um, hopefully. So, uh, bearing in mind that those are the topics, I think, that were mentioned loosely, uh, Council Sharp, what, what is it you would like to, to change here? Um, I, I'm not, um, I would agree with Councillor Kane in terms of maybe looking at the definition of fraud because the fact that it came from the Audit Commission some while back makes me think perhaps there, because in those days, cyber fraud, I know, you know, it's still fraud, but that wouldn't have been around at all. Um, so it'd be interesting to see how it's defined now. Um, and I think the, the consistency between it's being picked up between the Bribery Act and the anti-money laundering, which doesn't mention members. I know, well, it's possible that members could be involved in money laundering, but the likelihood is not because we don't actually touch the cash. But um, there's still instances where it could be. And so, so I think that needs to be in there as well. Perhaps that to move it forward, if... Um, Members could set, could could put into words the suggestions that have been made if Tracy hasn't captured them, and we bring it back to the next meeting, and then um, agree it then to go for the full council, because um, we're pr it's probably not going to it won't make the council this week. The next council meeting is not till February, so provide I don't providing the timings are right, we could actually. It, it wouldn't delay going to a, a full council meeting anyway, if we look at it at the end of January. So, it, yes, what are you going to, we've just got definition, scope and accountable accountability. Um, if we were to reword the recommendation uh, um, that we do ask the officer to look at certain named areas of the policy, strategy, sorry, it's not policy, um, uh, would, would the committee be happy for he and I to work on on this with a view to looking at what the areas are and then returning this as a paper to the next meeting. Did that work? Okay, that work. So that gives us a, a time to have. A, uh, I just want to move this on now because obviously we will we'll be nitpicking this and that and, and the other. So, so in, in which case, what I'm really looking for is a consensus that that's what we're going to do. We're going to recommend that there are certain areas of the policy strategy that we would need to have uh, uh, further work done on to be returned uh, in, in conjunction with the chair and returned to the next committee in January. Is there, would everybody be happy to go with that? So other than Ian. <laughs> so, okay, well, let's, let's we'll just assume that that's going to happen. We don't need to go to the vote and we'll, we'll, we'll move on. Okay, so now we're... Rachel, we got to your bit eventually. Thank you very much indeed. So we're moving to agenda item nine, internal audit progress report. And this is for noting only. And we did have um, some, some questions which you have very kindly answered. But if you could just talk to the report to start with, please. Thank you, Chair. So this is the latest update on the delivery of this year's internal audit plan. So we are making good progress in delivery of your audit plan. Uh, as I mentioned at the last audit committee meeting, we've also brought forward your financial audits this year, mindful that you have external audit in, in quarter four. So since this report was issued uh, for these papers, we've actually now planned in and agreed the scope and the timing of all of those financial audits as well. Uh, so we've got a, a quite a significant amount of the audit plan now underway. So on pages five to seven of the appendix is a copy of the internal audit plan as at the time of producing this report with the latest outcomes and progress. So as members will note, we have finalised a further audit report at the time of producing this progress report. So that's in relation to safeguarding. 
Uh, the findings of that are summarised for members at section 2.3 from page two of appendix one. So as, uh, as, as you'll note from the, the overview that was provided in the report, whilst we confirmed that there's a, a general framework in place for safeguarding, uh, we've got established processes for making referrals, referral forms in use, information sharing agreements are in place and being complied with. Um, there are where a number of areas that we have highlighted for, for further action as well to strengthen further. The policy was known to, to, to require review and update, so that's obviously something that does need to be taken forward. We've also recommended looking at developing a training matrix going forward so that we're clear on who should have what training and make sure there's a monitoring mechanism for that so we can clearly demonstrate the compliance with, with that training going forward. We did look at um, the completion of disclosure and barring service checks, so we looked at that both for taxi license holders and for our own staff where we feel there's a safeguarding potential risk if there's a regulated post. In terms of that testing, we were really happy with the progress and the, the work that's underway for taxi license holders, so the, the, there was 100% compliance with the expected controls there in terms of those checks. We did highlight some areas for improvement in terms of staff DBS checks to making sure that those are conducted in a timely manner so that again there are some recommendations around that. Uh, so the, as I say this, the key sections are set out in, in the report and overall we've given a satisfactory assurance opinion both for the design of the controls and the compliance based on our testing. Because of the nature of safeguarding we've given a moderate risk um, associated with that until those uh, areas of the framework are fully completed. We've also, within the period, been working on verification of disabled facilities grant monies, which we have to sign off to the County Council by the end of September, so that is complete. We've also been supporting with preparation and uploads for the National Fraud Initiative exercise, which needs to take place this year. And um, as I say, we have since made a progress on a number of other assignments, um, which has since uh, completed as well during that, that time. So uh, the other update that we did have for you at the time of completing this progress update was uh, the latest in our rolling risk reviews. So I uh, presented the first of these to members of the committee at the last meeting. And we followed the same approach as was endorsed by the committee uh, at that meeting in terms of this update. So the, the risk that we have looked at this time was risk C4, which is in relation to compliance with data protection legislation, which obviously looks at GDPR and the Data Protection Act. I actually have a member of my wider team who is a qualified data protection officer, so she did conduct this review for me and is obviously very um, comprehensive in her coverage. And the outcomes of that review are provided for you in table five um, of the papers from page 12. So we did confirm that the controls that were listed on the risk register were generally in place in the majority of cases and that based on our testing they did seem to be operating. Effectively, we did highlight, however, two of the areas uh, where we did make recommended actions. So the first was in relation to staff and member training. So whilst it's listed on the risk register that we have that training, when we've looked at the training records, the, the attendance was perhaps not what we would have expected. So we have recommended uh, some actions which are detailed within the report to make sure that those are fully evidenced going forward and that we're on top of those attendance records. The other was in relation to the um, the record of processing activity. So again, we do have that in place. The vast majority of it was up to date, but we identified one area that did need addressing. I believe that, I'm sure officers can confirm, but I believe that has since been actioned. So hopefully members are, are happy that, that that process is continuing to add value to you as a uh, giving assurance over the risk management process and uh, giving you some insight into those controls as well. So also within the, the update report is the usual update on progress on implementation of audit recommendations. So table two on page eight provides the overview which shows that we have marked seven actions as implemented since the last committee meeting. We do currently have 14 that are overdue. Um, so of those two are in the category that we always give you full details on which is the either high or medium priority and over three months overdue. So there are two of those, both medium priority, and those are detailed for you on table three, and they actually relate to actions that did come to the last meeting, but we've given you the latest update on those as of the time of producing this report. So we continue to follow up on those, and again, we'll report to you at the next committee and uh, on the next implementation of the uh, actions and completion of audits. So I'm happy to take any questions, Chair. Thank you very much. We had some tabled questions. Um, uh, 
I always am pleased to see drill down questions, if I may say so, on safeguarding, which is such an important aspect of what we all do. So uh, thank you for those questions. Are you satisfied with the answers that you that you're, are you okay or not? <laughs> okay. Are they the ones that are written or have you or, or are there additional ones? So it, it it it's basically, I mean the answers as they stand are are answers, but they they don't um resolve my concerns. Are you happy for me to yeah. run through them? So, um, are there things that Rachel can answer, or Rachel can pick up for on the inter in terms of internal audit? Um, Sorry, I, no, I, I don't know whether it will be um, Ian or Rachel who can answer them. Um, Sorry, I, I think it might just be worth adding that the majority of the questions weren't really questions that I could answer. Uh, yes. uh, they were for the service areas, really but I'm happy to chip in yeah. as I can, yeah. Yeah. depending on any further information that's needed. I mean, at, at the risk of being a broken record, this goes back to not being able to invite the appropriate officer to the meeting because the safeguarding officer should be here to answer the questions um, because my concern is uh, she said that she has sufficient time to carry out the role uh, and yet um, the evidence would suggest that that's incorrect. Um, it's interesting that she has no proportion of her time allocated to safeguarding. Um, that's always a worry to me if, if somebody's doing safeguarding off the corner of their desk as it were um, without having allocated time, um, I'm absolutely certain that should there be any concern, she would drop everything and, and follow it up. Um, but whether she has adequate time to make sure all the proper processes are in place and being followed, um, I'm, I'm not convinced. And I really think it's important for this council to allocate proper time for that. So, um, we, we were told that a third of the safeguarding, uh, the designated safeguarding officers who are named in the policy are, are no longer employed by the council. Um, and the answer I got to how is she informed is that she's notified by HR. Well, somewhere the system isn't working, either that HR didn't notify her or they did notify her and she hasn't had time to correct the document and more importantly, uh, find and, the, and train the, the three new, new DSOs. And, and this is really, really, really important because the whole thing about safeguarding, you can have procedures, you can have DBS checks, they're all really important. But the key thing is, as it were, the smell test. Do you think that people are behaving appropriately or is there something a little bit odd now that's why these dso's are so important because they're in all different parts of the council and they they will be seeing uh day to day what is happening there if you like the the the, the beyond the everyday staff who are also frontline support they are the key support for spotting if something is going wrong and and we have a third of them who were not even still employed by the council. Uh, again, I, I think this suggests that there is insufficient time being devoted to it. And we come back to the training. Uh, the answer I got on the training, I asked without a record, how does the officer know staff have been adequately and appropriately trained? And I get the answer, training has always been provided. Fine, it's provided, but are people doing it are they understanding it? Um, we, we absolutely, <laughs> we, we, we deal with all sorts of um, vulnerable people uh, in our day-to-day -day activities on this council. We absolutely have to make sure that people have had the, the appropriate training and, and the refresher. And I'm, I'm really worried uh, that, that we don't have something in place. Now I can see that the reason our policy isn't as up to date as it might be is because we very wisely have a safeguarding board which has got multiple agencies, which is, I think, good practice. Um, nevertheless, uh, we need to have uh, up to date um, policies and procedures. Everybody needs to understand what they are. And having got it up to date by the end of November, which I'm pleased it's gonna be done by then, we need a system to make sure it is kept up to date. 
um, so that, that we know uh, that the safeguarding is, is being followed. So it's satisfactory and, and generally speaking, we should be satisfied with satisfactory, but I'm not sure I am on safeguarding. I think I would rather see good. Um, and there's a lot of little weaknesses here. And it all comes back in, in my mind, the suspicion in my mind is that we haven't allocated someone sufficient time to, to do the overview. Like I say, I have absolutely no doubt that if something was going wrong, it would be addressed rapidly. Uh, but it's more to do with stopping something going wrong by having all the processes in place. And I'm, I know it's satisfactory, but actually on safeguarding, I don't think satisfactory is good enough. Thank you. Want to make a, uh, a comment? I don't know. Uh, um, it's normal for uh, I, I don't know the answer, but it's normal for organisations to do safeguarding reviews regularly, are internally done. Um, I'm just wondering whether we've done those and how often we do them. I don't know the answer to the question, but it's an it's quite normal for organisations to do that. Yeah, sorry, Rachel. Uh, to you, Chair, I just thought I'd add to that. So I would completely agree. And I think perhaps that's the role that we are undertaking as internal audit. We do this audit every, I believe it's every two to three years, we would include this in our audit plan. Um, so we do that. But obviously, if I'm not aware of when council does anything else internally uh, in terms of that. I mean, just asking from my personal perspective, um, what does one have to do to turn satisfactory to good? And actually having been in education all, all my life, safeguarding is such a high priority. So I think this is what we're, we're, we're saying. We would like to see good next time. And I think the implications are quite clear. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, just to add, sorry, just to add yeah, to that chair, if I may. Um, so we have, in total, we made eight recommendations on the audit. Some of those were low priority, uh, but obviously some of them are higher priority based on the, the issues that we've mentioned. So, in my view, once those actions are completed, that's what brings us up to a um, a good or a more satisfactory level. I think this, I have to agree, this is something this committee would wish to see. Yeah. Uh, would it be reasonable to ask that those actions be implemented uh, and the implementation reported back to this committee? Um, we don't meet again till January, so I wonder if we could have uh, a written report um, by the end of this year. Is that possible? Yeah, Rachel? Sorry, just from, from me, Chair. Obviously, we follow these actions up on a monthly basis, as we yeah. do with all of the audit recommendations. Uh, so we are certainly on, on, the, on track with those. As to whether members wanted a specific report on these audit recommendations, obviously, if they want not implemented, they will come to you as overdue audit recommendations yes, in the summary. That, but, but if you wanted specific yeah. feedback, I'm happy to do a, a standalone table if that yes, was sufficient. I think, I think you'd like to see that. We don't want it. We don't want it overdue. We want it actually. Um, uh, yeah, we do. It's really important. Yeah, if you wouldn't mind, thank you. Um, sorry, can I just sorry, yeah, sorry. just to confirm sorry, for that? Yes. Is that outside of the meeting, or is that at the next meeting you would like that update in January? Is it possible to have it prior to the next meeting? Is it possible? Um, to have that? That's just an our, update. This is with, with bear in mind we're going from October, November, December, get three months. Is that possible? We will we'll facilitate that for for, <coughs> for committee. Although it's um, you know, obviously only requested. It. For the end of the year, and that yeah. may be all more in line with the committee timetable. Anyway, I'm not sure when the yeah. committee is in January. But. but if you could look at, and I think if I may just say, um, the updated child and, and adults at risk safeguarding policy, it's it's fine for everybody to have it. It's what happens with those who've got it um, uh, that that is that is important. And uh, being sent a policy as a member doesn't necessarily mean that members. Um, take due and have due understanding of what the implications are if I, if I may just say that right yes um would it not be better is as it's as it's so important and as a committee that we're clearly concerned across the board would it not be better 
for that standalone table and that report to come to the next committee for the sake of what three weeks or whatever it's the difference is going to be because we've got Christmas in the middle Mm -hmm. it isn't it doesn't it get proper proper robust debate and airing if it comes to the committee rather than us all get it at home yeah and take no notice of that yeah yes Charlotte uh, ideally I'd like a bit of both I because I'd, I'd like to know before Christmas that we've made significant progress uh, if not completed uh, everything um, and certainly I would like to discuss it at the next meeting as well we know that so we, uh, Alan did you have your hand up um I mean yes the, the only item I had of to pick up was in on the internal audit report is the safeguarding um, and I, I sort of share the concerns of everybody. I do share Councillor Kane's concern in respect of compliance and satisfactory reading, you know, page three of the report. Um, and I think from, from a management point of view, the, the through the line management system, there needs to be, you know, attention taken of, of this issue because it is a very important issue. Um, I take the fact that it's, maybe moderate organizational impact but maybe compliance um it certainly is nowhere near compliant judged on on the narrative rachel has given us and and therefore i think it's one that we need to take very very seriously and get resolved as if it's going to be done by the end of november that's only five weeks time that's great but we just need to make sure that it is and so would it and, be... and it doesn't happen again yeah no uh, so would it be fair to ask if we could have some indication within a couple of months before Christmas that things have moved forward and it comes to the committee in January. Could I ask for that? Please? I'll commit to providing something to the yeah. committee before Christmas, supported by Rachel. Yeah, thank you. Really. Right, I don't know where we are now. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Charlotte. If, if, if there's no other comments on the um, safeguarding, I, I had a comment about the or audit on um, the risk C4. Okay. On the second page of the questions. Yeah. So, so this this is um, this is the risk that um, we may not be compliant with the data protection legislation, um, and um, I I asked um, where the reason why. Uh, we hadn't changed the uh, the risk uh, calculation, um, given that the controls were found not to be fully operating. The answer I've got is that they didn't have a scheduled meeting, and so they haven't reviewed it, um, but the actions are complete. Um, I'm not entirely sure they are, because um, the one they've said are complete is that the uh, Anglia Revenue Partnerships has responded to the uh, ROPA statement, which is good because that was a pretty piggy. Um, but um, the, there are other uh, controls that we were told aren't operating. So uh, the training, for example, um, and I apologise if I'm one of them, which I may well be since only two members have apparently <laughs> done it. Um, so I may well be one of the ones who hasn't. Uh, there's, there's about a third of staff haven't done the training. Um, well, if we're not doing the training, then we may well not know uh, what our responsibilities are under data protection. So that isn't offering us a control because there's too many people who haven't done it. Um, I'm, I'm pleased that anything that is reported as a data breach is put on the register and uh, assessed and investigated. I, and I know it's really difficult to, to prove a negative as it were, um, but I would like some sort of work to be done to get a feel for whether everything is being reported, particularly given that such a high proportion of people haven't had the training. Um, there's a very good chance uh, that breaches may be happening and not getting recorded, therefore not getting investigated um, and, and recommendations. Um, and um, the, the, the um, control that was said to be um, green, um, it did actually 
say that um, this is the guidance. It did actually say that um, some of the guidance um, may need um, to be updated. Um, so even the control that is in place may not be as up to date as, as it should be. Um, so given that the inherent risk for this is 15, uh, which would require six monthly review, it, it worries me that the uh, risk management group haven't considered it given that their controls are, are not operating. I mean, if, if staff, if a third of staff and most of members haven't done the training, then we have to assume that at least those number of people don't fully understand how they're meant to comply with, with data protection. Um, just, just to answer, I mean, it's more of a statement rather than a question, but to, to take it as a question, um, the website has now been updated and said so the information available to them, uh, to officers of, of the website is, 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 is correct and up to date. <laughs> Corporate management team have had a discussion about ensuring that officer training is mandatory moving forward and procedures will be put in place to ensure that is the case moving forward. CMT was less or was found it difficult to find a way of imposing that on members, but clearly there'll be encouragement to members to to, to do the um, training moving forward. And so therefore on the on the next round of training, which I haven't got a date for that, but when the next round of training takes place, there will be a mandatory requirement for all staff to do that. I think if I can just make a, a, a comment that uh, the six meetings we've had, training arises from many instances. And uh, I'm not, not that it may not be happening, but that it is not being cross-referenced and we have no evidence. And we certainly have no evidence of what impact that might have. Um, certainly, I appreciate that you can't push members into doing something they don't want to do, but the leaders of our parties can absolutely do that because that's what our role is, is to ensure that our members are compliant. Uh, and that's something I'm quite happy to take away uh, uh, from my other perspective while you concentrate on the, on the staff. So uh, I think that's 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 really important. But GDPR is something that will come back and hit us if we go get it right. And it's a bit like safe. So, so it's, it is really important. But I think it, it, the message really is that we will always be looking at uh, training and how effective it is, that will be part of our role, because without that training, we can't guarantee, we can't even try to guarantee that actually things are, are in place. So I think this is an area that we really, uh, I know you focused on it, but it, it comes up every time, every area that you, you, you do. Um, yes. Thank you, Chair, I 100% agree with that. Um, <laughs> and and I, I'm pleased to hear that uh, CMT are taking action to uh, Im improve this. However, my, my point is about the risk register as it currently stands. And we've reduced the residual risk because the training is happening. The training isn't happening. And therefore, I would like to understand why the risk management group hasn't reviewed um, the, the, the residual risk because their controls are not happening. Uh, that's a really key control, uh, as the chair's just said, training is, is a really key control. It, it, it's not happening. Uh, so it can't be reducing the risk. Um, and I don't, I don't understand why, it, if we've, we've got internal audit very helpfully doing this work for us and looking at each of the risks and whether the controls are in place, I, d I don't understand why there isn't a mechanism for the reason uh, the risk management group to be told that some of the controls aren't working and review the the risk Im immediately it seems disconnected to have internal audit do the work and report to us which is helpful but 
the risk management group don't follow up on it, which until their next meeting, which doesn't seem to make sense because if if the controls aren't working, then the risk on this could be 15, which means it's it it clicks into a higher level of review and control. Um, so so if that's the case, it needs to be done straight away. And if it's not the case, we as an audit committee need to understand what the arguments are for maintaining the low residual risk, given that the controls are not operating. Could, could I ask the question uh, uh, for, for something outside this meeting that um, we ask um, what the mechanism is for the risk management group knowing what is happening from the internal audit? I don't know what that. Uh, I don't know what that mechanism is. Does it? Does it happen regularly? Yes. Tell us. Thank you, Keisha. So, um, as part of this process, we deal with the risk owner who is nominated on the risk register. Um, obviously, feedback to them and discuss with them whether or not the risk scoring that's currently applied seems to be res reflective of the current risk environment. Uh, obviously, as we've as I've emphasised in the past, it's not for us to determine the score okay. or to say whether or not it should change. We mustn't own that. We just advise and try and facilitate that process. Um, so if a change in the score is proposed as part of that process, I would then take that to the next risk management group as something that's been proposed as a change to the risk score. Because you're on the risk management Yes, so I attend that again as an as a, as a independent third party on the group, not a member of the group, but somebody that's there to, to feed information in. So we would feed into that, that meeting if that was the case. Obviously, if there wasn't one, then we would need to look at it before it next came to the committee, but that would... Um, right, because we had a situation where there wasn't one, so I, it's just... Because so there wasn't a proposed change, so nothing was fed back to the, the, the risk management group, but there is that mechanism that is the idea of the process. Okay, I think we just have to leave that here, really. Let's ask one further question. What, what were the risk owners' reasons for deciding that uh, the residual risk didn't need to change, given that uh, the controls weren't fully operating? I think... I don't know that we have the answer to that. Uh, is it possible to get the answer to that and send round? Is that something we could just get outside the meeting about what that process was? Because I don't think anybody here's got can have the answer to that. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah, it, it's sort of developing that point. So it, it just make to get um, if I get clear in my mind just that the sequence of events. So the the audit was done. Uh, the findings were presented to the um, the risk management group. Uh, there were a number of actions that were recommended actions. At the time of that meeting, none of those recommended actions presumably had been progressed. But the residual risk was the same. There was no no change to made to the risk. Well, that's the question we're asking. So we should get a response to that. I think all you've done is clarified what our thinking is here, which is good. Well, I'm, 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 but I'm, is, is what I've just described correct? Well, that's what we're going to to. There is nobody here who can tell us. Give, give us that. Well, answer. we've got at least two people who are at the meeting. I think we need to take this outside this meeting. The question we've asked will circulate the answer. I think that's the best way forward. Uh, but um, could I ask the two, the, uh, the internal auditor and the officer who was present at that meeting, what their understanding of what that meeting was, what what that meeting agreed, or whether my let's say the sequencing of events, as I've suggested, was correct. I think, I think Chair's, the Chair's right that we need to go away and, and, and consider this. You know, clearly the recommend, the vast majority of the recommendations which came out of the audit findings have been implemented. And so therefore, those implementations equally need to be considered in the risk, the, the revised risk score as to the audit recommendations in the first place. Okay, so let's, let, uh, can we ask the question? We'll not finish this at all if we're not careful. So let's just, let's uh, let's go where we were and uh, Ian will come back to us on that. Any more questions? Because I've got one. Yeah, no, no I've, yeah, I've still got some more questions. So, so we've been told the recommendations have been implemented. Uh, so are all new starters now um, 
has online training been created and completed for all new starters? So does the oh, new sorry, starters go that, through that process on uh, data protection training? I think that's some also something that we yeah, need to that that come back. Place? Uh, be, it's you said by November, didn't you? I mean, again, that, that was the decision made by corporate management team and the implementation is, is taking place, has taken place. I, I don't know exactly where we are on that, but that was a decision made by corporate management team that the all new starters will and it should be given a protection training. And we will take this away with our members and we will make sure that they do their GDPR training. Well, what I can say for members, at least uh, I think I was one of the one of the two um that talking to my colleagues none of them have have had a reminder or request to do the online training since this audit has com been completed so that would imply to me the action is still open and hasn't been closed uh bill i've got it black and white here there yeah been i think closed. i i think we're just going round and round i think no, we no we're not going round and round i'm asking a question yeah. has so well I'm, I'm not even asking the question i know for for I, I am very confident that members have not been asked to complete uh, data protection training since the some audit have, was and Some haven't by their leaders. So I don't want to go into the nitty gritty of what members are doing. So I think it's our responsibility, if we've been requested to do that, that we need to look at that ourselves. So I really would like to move on now. I think we've stunned us. Well, no, no, I think this is a crucial, we've got, a, we've got a number of findings here. So so have all staff now completed? Are staff now at 100% or still at 65%? I think or the officer has answered that question. It's It's been implemented. Um, he, when it's 100%, if you could let us know, but I think the officers answered the question what, as it what, is. What does implemented mean? That they have, uh, the staff have under, undertaken the training. They have undertaken the training. Could, 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 if we haven't got the information now, could that be shared to members after the meeting? The number, the uh, as of today, the number of members who have completed the training. I mean, can can I clarify? The there is a round of training each year, and the training for twenty twenty one. The, the figures which of staff in members is 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 been picked up in the audit. There will be another round of training this year, which I remember exact dates I'm not clear about, but it, I think there's a new set of training to, to take place in the next month or so. And it's that new set of training which takes place, which there will be a requirement for a mandatory requirement for all staff to do, and there will be a far stronger push to ensure that Which all members. members take part in that this new round of training starting sh shortly. So I think we're so not looking back on what happened. Sorry, no, yeah, I think we're we, not looking back. I think we, the question's been answered as far as the audit committee is con concerned. And I'd like to, to move on, please. Charlotte, unless you've got another subject area. I have a really important principle, point of principle to raise on this. I asked why the risk management group didn't think the residual risk needed to change. And I was told, as can be seen in the next response, the actions from the review have been actioned. The risk management group did not have a scheduled meeting and therefore review the risk until the actions had been completed. So at this point, there was no requirement to increase the residual score risk. So the process is we've had internal audit telling us the controls are not in place. Yeah. We are being told that they will be put in place. Good, excellent. I want that to happen. Mm -hmm. But until it happens, what is the risk? Because the risk we are currently working to is assuming that those are in place and they are not. So, so this answer is, is, is misleading, which is not helpful. And it, it's really important that, that we understand the link between these things. A residual risk is because there are controls in place that are operating as expected and intended. We've been told in this case that they're not. So I cannot see how that answer is, is remotely acceptable. Oh, and I would like it noted in the minutes 
that I am not satisfied by that answer because we have found out from subsequent questioning that the actions have not yet been implemented. And to be fair, the officer has agreed to go away and answer those questions and come back to us. So we've moved on from the answer. So, But I would like it minuted that I'm not satisfied with that and for the reasons I gave. Right, so can I ask a question about IT? Because <laughs> I really would like to talk. I just wanted to ask a question about, uh, uh, on page 10, um, uh, about the uh, ICT outages. There's a statement which says, um, the team can only recall three incidents in the past 18 years, that the increase in cost could not be justified for, for a programme. I would just like to make the comment that I would have thought that the increase in cyber security and outages has increased hugely over the last few years and I don't know whether three incidents was 18 years ago or three in, three instances over the last three years so I, I think again that kind of statement is not really helpful but I only just wanted to to make that do we know how many there were in I mean 18 years is immaterial five years is important three years is important in terms of, of the escalation of ICT outages it, it, generally yeah, I mean, the, this question, uh, the statement here is to do with whether it's worth the council on a cost effective basis getting enhanced Microsoft cover. Yeah. And clearly, it's not specifically about cyber, this is about Microsoft support generally, rather than as they're not specifically about cyber. And it's, the history is that. The council has very, very rarely needed to have the additional Microsoft support, which this audit recommendation suggests. And because this, um, because this enhanced support is quite expensive, I won't go in public meeting how much it is. Mm. There is a value for money. We were talking about value in the audience. Even there is a value for money criteria which we need to consider about whether it's worth taking out this extra support or whether we deal with incidents on the one foot as they happen and pay for the support at that point rather than having a support individual support package. Can I ask how often that will be reviewed then? If we have to wait for another outage before we make a decision. I'm just you know it's about the speed of which ICT outages are, are, are appearing and it's a fear in, the, in every business area that these are those so, so I would uh, urge that that is reviewed carefully because, uh, because we know what huge damage it does to everything that happens to us all so I, I, that's why I queried 18 years in view of ICT you know, three days is a, is a lot Right, is there anything? Yeah, <laughs> sorry, I want to pick up on the same thing um, because um, I, 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 I hear what uh, the officer says, but what we're looking at here is agreed actions. So the auditor did their review, they found weaknesses, they recommended actions, the uh, officers agreed those actions, that's what it says, agreed action. Uh, it was agreed that they would be implemented in both the cyber security and the ICT outages by the 31st of March, 2022. Here we are in October, 2022, and they haven't been done. Um, and that worries me. Um, and at the last meeting, it worried members and we asked a question and we were told there, there, were, uh, there was sufficient um, capacity and that resources were going to be directed at it. And here we are, and it isn't done. Now, I don't want to beat the staff up because uh, as it says um, in the answer to my question, I think uh, they have been working uh, more than round the clock. Yeah. Um, and and um, uh, that's not the object of my question. Yeah. Uh, the, the object of my question is really, have we got the resource? can we deliver what we've agreed to deliver? And, and if in the Microsoft support package, the decision now by officers is that we're not going to do it, how, what's the alternative mechanism by which we address the weakness that internal audit identified? Um, I, I, 
I'm, I'm seriously worried that um, internal audit spends time looking at our systems for us to try and discover the weaknesses before they cause us problems, recommending actions we should take. Officers agree those actions. Those actions are reported to us as an audit committee uh, and presumably to operational committees as relevant. Um, and then they don't happen. Um, and, and, and this is a worry to me. So I would like to, to know, I'd like a timetable for when um, the cybersecurity um, actions are going to be completed. Um, and I would like to know, I, I'd like um, either it comes to us or to the relevant uh, operational committee, but I would like somebody to see what the officers are proposing to put in place uh, in place of the Microsoft support package uh, and whether internal audit feel that that will satisfactorily address the weakness that they first identified. So just to pick up on the, the IT outages, the, the recommendation for audit is quite clear that the council should conduct an options appraisal and cost benefit analysis. It doesn't say we will implement an enhanced support package. We already have a support package with Microsoft, and the a paper will be going as as in the um, answer or the, the update. A paper will be going to corporate management team, expressing the options to corporate management team for a final decision to be made. Okay. Thank you. If there are no many questions. So, so sorry. So, I, I must have missed that. I thought you had said it was too expensive and we weren't going to be doing it. I must have misunderstood. It's, it's my view, having, under, having obviously been close to this, that I believe it is too expensive, but clearly it's not for me as a single officer to make that decision. It will be made as a collective as CMT. Thank you. Right. We I really think we need to move on, and this is really, really important. Well, no, it's just to, to, to finish off on this, this I, point. I don't want to just keep repeating the same things over again. If I, I'm not suggesting you do, but... No, but I, what I'm trying to understand is, is how the, the judgment that too expensive is, 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 uh, is being made, because... Um, uh, but if I may just interrupt, that was only uh, the officer's uh, uh, personal view, because there's an, uh, an appraisal going Yeah, I, I the, think we've, that's, we've, that's... we've had a discussion on kind of officers' views and beliefs, but, but usually sorry? usually what I would expect to do, so generally with, um, with an enhanced support package, you get a much faster response, and you then need to look at the you know the, the, the cost of losing that service, for example, the whole council's email going down, and how quickly you can resolve that. And as we become more and more dependent on those services, the cost to the organization is pretty huge, even if it only happens once a, a, in every other year. But I think um, that's the discussion that's going to happen at that meeting. It's not us for us to go through that appraisal, that option appraisal. So it's, it's up to our professionals to manage that process. They're going to take a, a cost-benefit analysis to that meeting, and we need to allow them to do that. No. They are, after all, our staff, our professionals. Uh, and what, could we what, could we be told the outcome of that sort of discussion? And Sorry, I can't hear you. Could we be told the outcome of that discussion? I suspect we will be told the rationale outcome. behind it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, clearly you've got yeah. an audit um, recommendation here, which which we will be addressing, and so therefore, um, you know, clearly when that audit recommendation is resolved. There's, there's no reason why you, you should, you know, this, it, that should be made available to the committee. Yeah. So as this was for noting, I should believe we have noted and gone through this as far too, so thank you very much in, indeed. Does anybody, uh, I know we are, I'm aware that we are live streaming, but does anybody just need a comfort break before we go on or are we all right to plough on? You kind of, <laughs> so if we just give ourselves uh, uh, five or six minutes, is that okay? Uh, uh, and we stop our live stream uh, for that period of time. So yes, please do go and do whatever.
So welcome back to those who are still with us. Uh, so now we're going on to our agenda item number 10, uh, risk appetite, and the committee is asked to note the contents of this report, which will be introduced by Ian. Thank you, Chair. As detailed in the paper, the risk appetite has to be a subjective view. As your Section 151 officer, I detail in the paper the current appetite score, which, in my opinion, allows risk to be managed in the right place in the organisation. As this is the case, it is my recommendation that the score should remain unchanged. Thank you, Chair. We have no written questions, but questions to the author, please. Councillor King. I don't seem to have Appendix 1 in my papers. Did it go out separately? Appendix 2. Appendix 2, do you mean? Hmm? Under Appetite Bris 3.3, it says two. scoring yeah. matrix attached at Appendix 1. That's quoting the risk management policy, though, isn't it? Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I, I find this a, a deeply disappointing report. Um, it doesn't describe the thought processes behind the risk appetite of 15. It doesn't address the issues that have been raised several times by this committee about the perverse outcomes of the scoring system whereby we're apparently stating that we think that an activity is acceptable and doesn't need to be escalated to corporate management team, even where there is a possible risk of death. Bear in mind that the definition of possible is the event might occur at some time as there is a history of occasional occurrence at the council. Now, clearly it isn't our role to second guess the risk management group, but it is our role to test whether they can show robust processes behind their decisions. I'm afraid this paper doesn't convince me that there are robust processes. It reads to me like it's what we've always done and nothing has gone wrong so far, so it must be okay. And we're asked to suggest different scores with an explanation as to why we think these are more appropriate when the risk management group hasn't given their reasons for the current scoring. In 4.4, we're asked, the question is, do we feel that any risk has not been managed in the right place in recent years? Well, I fundamentally disagree that that is the question, but accepting that it is a question that the risk management group are asking, uh, what about the cyber security issues, the ICT outages, uh, East Cambridge street scene failing to deliver on their business plans and expected levels of performance, our failure to deliver the housing strategy and provide affordable housing, our difficulties with staff recruitment, absence and retention, leading to lack of resources. There are quite a few things uh, that are not operating as well as we would like, uh, which suggests that the risk of those hasn't been managed in the right place. As I say, I don't think that's really the question. We, we've discussed this at committee, many, many times and have been really clear on what we're asking for from, from officers. And I, I, I still do not understand the arguments behind why the risk is 15. So maybe Ian can give me the background, give me the arguments that are not in this paper for why they feel that 15 is, is the right figure. Well. 16 is the figure which we will not accept. Do chair, do you chair? Yeah. The, the answer to the question is in the paper and I don't particularly want to repeat what's in the paper. The, 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 the answer is in the paper, the review is undertaken. The view, my view is your section 151 office is the risk appetite score is correct. And the history in pre in recent years suggests that to be the case. Clearly, you, you've you've 
mentioned a number of things where things could have been uh, things which have obviously not what as the council would have liked hoped in the last few years but the risk register is to do with identifying risk it's not to you, you can't stop ed, anything bad happening and clearly bad things do happen but the risk register was a you know had um was conscious of those things potentially happening and so, and so and and therefore was doing its job the point of the risk register is to enable the organization as far as possible to avoid the risks happening or to manage the risks appropriately if they do happen so it's really important that the risks are considered and managed at the right level within council. And what we're saying is that it's pretty routine management up to and including a risk of 15. It has to be a risk of 16 before we take it to corporate management team, audit committee and the council. So I am asking, why, what are the thought processes behind the view that it is reasonable that an activity that we think has a possibility of leading to death should be managed simply as a routine every six month monitoring because it might cause the council some difficulties rather than being in excess of our risk appetite and something that we would want closely managed by the corporate management team. Through you, Chair, I refer again to section 4.4 to 4.6 of the report and that answers the question. I'm sorry, Chair, but it clearly doesn't answer the question. I'm asking, 4.4 is suggesting it hasn't happened. Good, I'm delighted. I don't want it to happen. However, what this paper is about is our risk appetite. So this is saying we are happy for an activity to continue in this council if there is a possibility that it could lead to death. And we are happy for that to keep going with routine monitoring. We don't feel that that is something that should go to the corporate management team, the audit committee and council. And I would like to understand why we don't think that. Because personally, I have to say, I do think it should go to corporate management team, audit committee and council. But I'd like to understand why the, re the risk management group doesn't think it should, why it thinks that's should just have routine management overview. Could I, could I ask, do you mind if I ask you a question, Charlotte? Is, is, do you mind if I ask you a question? Ask me? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> and as, as a greater expert than I am, <clears throat> are you talking specifically about a number of risks that we have within our policy that might lead to death, which are stated, um, because obviously there are uh, um, not all activities we hope uh, will lead uh, to that. Are you are you talking about some individual specifics that you feel should be looked at in differently? Because uh, it's it's a bit like your doctor's prescription, isn't it? Side effects could lead to death, uh, but we hope that they, that they don't, and you'll just get a headache. So it, it it's about not quite clear what it is that you are looking for, whether you are expecting specific risks that you feel have not been uh, adequately risked uh, assessed, that you would like to have re-risk assessed through the management committee, <coughs> or are you suggesting that that 15 is, is, the, is the wrong number, that it should be 16 or 14, in which case, obviously, different things apply. That, that I'm not quite clear, and I'm, sh I'm sure Ian is clear, but for me, I would like that clarification because I'm, I'm not absolutely clear. So, so this, this isn't <laughs> about specific risks. This is about our risk appetite. And our risk appetite currently is that anything 16 and above 
would be in excess of our appetite and therefore would have to go to corporate management team to make sure that it was something we really had to do and we had done all the mitigations we could and we were monitoring it really closely. So, so this is about where we set that yeah. level. Yeah. And I'm trying to understand why the risk management <laughs> group feels it should be set at 16. So one of the things I've looked at is how does it work arithmetically? So we've been given the table, I think at a couple, two meetings ago or something. And that, that table sets out the impact of a risk happening goes from negligible one up to very high, which is five. And the likelihood of it happening goes from very rare, which is one, up to very likely, which is five. So if you get five times five, you have a risk of 25, and that's going to get taken really, really seriously. If you have a risk of five times four, that's a 20, that's going to get taken seriously. But if you have a risk of five times three, so the impact could be five, which can include death, and the likelihood is possible, which means the event might occur at some time as there is a history of occasional occurrence at the council, that would be only 15. And therefore, it would be within our risk appetite and it would just be managed in the normal way. So I'm looking at the combination of where we say our risk appetite sits, i.e. 16, and what theoretical things could come within that. And as I say, it could be something that has a, a, a very high impact up to and including death, but also includes injury and large sums of money that is possible. We wouldn't escalate that up to um, corporate management team. And I don't personally understand why not. So I'd like to know why the risk management group say, why not? Conversely, we could have something that um, would create a significant level of minor injuries of employees, mistreatment or abuse of individuals for whom the council has a responsibility going back to the safeguarding press that we were talking about, that would be an impact of three. So we could say it is very likely that that will happen. Three times five is 15. We expect it to occur in most circumstances as there's a history of regular occurrence at the council. So we would be happy, apparently, that if, it regularly happened that people were getting injured or abused. It still wouldn't need corporate management team on the risk register because it would be a 15. That, that's why I don't understand this figure. And I want to understand from risk management group how they arrive at that, because I, I, can't, I can't grasp it. <coughs> Can I just come back on that? Because I'm just find it <coughs> really useful is um, that under what circumstances would the management group, would it ever reach 16? Uh, because it's not about the 15, is it? it's about what's below the 15, about how you manage that and what your thresholds are in order to make five fives or, or five threes or fives and two threes. So it's not about the 15, it's about what's happening underneath to get to the 15, or conversely, at, at what stage would, would we ever as a group man as a management group go beyond the 15 and identify that actually this is something that we need to go to the full council that seems i know that sounds very simplistic but to me that's that's what it's it's about it's, it's there must be a time when there is a 16 and how does that that happen what you're saying is that there's never going to be a time or are you suggesting there's never going to be a time that it's going to be Arith like arithmetically you can have a 16 serious injury uh, would be high impact and uh, strong possibility that will occur is likely. So that would be 16. But what um, the decision making for that is done within the group. That's what I'm saying. It's not about whether it's 15 or not. It's the decision making that goes, uh, decides whether it should be higher or lower. And it's that process rather than, I mean, it could be 25 and, and you could change the numbers underneath, but it's about the decision making within the group, which uh, is 
it, which is important. And, and are you suggesting, and I'm not saying you are, that actually the decision making within a group is not rigorous enough to actually get us to a state where risks that you are perceiving should be over 15 or 16 or 14 uh, is not happening. Oh, that, that's the clarification. I know that's really- No, what, what, what I'm saying is I disagree that our risk appetite should be that anything under 16 just gets routine treatment, given that there could be stuff at 15 that has a possible okay. death arising from it. So I think either the matrix is wrong because it doesn't give things sufficient uh, weight or the figure of 16 is wrong because it allows things that would be, to my mind, a serious risk that needs senior management consideration to, to stay as a, a routine risk. I think what we haven't done as an audit committee is just ask the question you just asked uh, um, uh, about uh, whether or not um, the management, risk management group uh, would uh, reassure us or not that the that this process and the matrix that we currently have allows for that kind of scrutiny in terms of the risk appetite does that make sense it, it, it's about the decision making it isn't about the numbers is it it's it, it's about the categories well, well it, it, it's both because when if they come to a decision that something is 15 I'm not sure that it is right that that should stay as a routine issue, given that 15 could be something that is a possible cause of death or a likely cause of injury or abuse. I, I don't think so. I don't think we've got the risk appetite in the right place if this is the matrix that we're using. I, I have nothing saying. against the matrix. Yeah. The bar is set too low. Too <laughs> Too low. So you're saying what you're saying is that it shouldn't be sixteen when it goes to the full council. It should be fifteen, or it. But it isn't about the fifteen, is it? It's about how the fifteen is it, made it, up. It, I'm, I'm, yes, I'm really asking risk management group to go and look at, <clears throat> given our matrix and the things that it, it says. What is the logical next step, as it were? Is 16 really the right figure? Um, maybe it is, and maybe it's the matrix that's wrong. I don't know. But as it stands, I think there are things that I feel, if we were to mark it at 15, actually, I wouldn't be comfortable that that wasn't going to senior management team, corporate management team, because... If, if something has a possible risk of death, um, then I think our corporate management team should be looking at it. Let's get down. Um, the, I think the most powerful example is actually the one, Councillor Kane, that you used a few a couple of minutes ago when, when you did was it there was it three times five yeah the significant level of minor injuries or mistreatment or abuse and and if that was very likely it would still be 15 and therefore within our risk appetite yeah i mean for me something that carries the possibility of death could be crossing the road couldn't it you know so so i think it's a, it's about the thing that's that's one half of me, but the other half of me finds that particular example quite a powerful one because the words play against the scoring in a way, don't they? Um, so I think it would be useful to understand, you know, to take that specific example, three times five. You know, what would fall in that? Because if we, if the risk management group gave us some examples of what would fall in that then it's always, as you keep saying, Chairman, it's about the, the actual stuff, isn't it? It's about the things, because the scoring is applied to a specific set of circumstances. And one would like to think that if the risk management group thought that it was, it should be over 16, they would find a way of scoring it to make sure it was over 16. Uh, but 
but it does still pose the question as to why does three times five exist at all then? <laughs> because you'd never use it on that basis, would no. you? Yeah. So, you know, I, I do think that it's, I, I'd like to know what might fall in that category, because if I knew that in real examples, then I might feel a bit better about how it's being applied, because it is all in the application. Is that the application? Yeah, Mark. Yeah. I do think so. There's a number of examples that, that Councillor Kane has given of this three times five that falls into the into the 15. I, I don't don't think we should be trying to set a new risk appetite necessarily, but but let's just assume for the moment our risk appetite was um, we went for a, uh, we we lowered it by one, so that those three times 15s always came up to the corporate management. Then actually, I think we'd probably address the concerns that Councillor Kane was was raising, and, and it's. I know we we actually asked in four point seven uh, why we think another another number would be appropriate. And actually, I think for me, actually adjusting it just by one to bring in those those, those examples that Councillor Kay mentioned uh, would, to me, it, I think is a a good justification as to why we we should look at a different number. It doesn't answer the why was it fifteen to start with, but maybe that's not. But the I'm just right wondering whether we need to answer the question why fifteen, but yeah. not come to me for the fifteen yeah, to yeah. see what's happening. I'm not, I don't normally do this, and I know you don't do this in committees, and I'm really sorry if I get this wrong, but I'd like to ask Councillor Sharp if she's got any perspective on that. I don't want to put you on the spot, Councillor, but I just think no, that's I why we're talking about it. No, I wanted to come in anyway. I, I think we we need to look um, further at this because basically what. Um, without putting words in her mouth, um, what, what I believe C Councillor Kane is hinting at, that some 15s are more bad than other 15s, for want of a better word. You know, obviously death is a very bad thing, and, and but that's scored 15, where there might be other risks that are not as severe, that are also 15. Um, and I think we, it would be useful as a committee to to to... to to look behind, I think some of those, and and look to see where to, to try to understand where, how that marking the three, you know, the five times three comes from, and what, and you'll get a well, I was going to say four times four, but that would automatically go above the above the line. But 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 it's trying to understand, I think, a bit more about what some of those risks relate to personally. Put it a way forward because obviously we're in a committee meeting and by recommendations or noting whatever it is. If um, I, I'm sorry, and just sort of thinking about that, whether this is something we could do outside the committee that we could actually discuss this with somebody from the group about how this this works, rather because other uh, we're not going to come to a conclusion. We're either going to bat it back or we're not going to bat it back, isn't it? It's not going to it's not going to make a, a, a but I think understanding, which is our own training, I think uh, might help us more understand and and realize where we're uh, coming. We're not trying to train change numbers. We're trying to under understand how that's I don't know what to what do you think? Big no. I mean, if I can come in there, Chair, huh? if I can come in and make a comment. I mean, clearly, my previous papers on risk management have asked the committee of their view on what they think the risk appetite should be, and there's always been a reluctance to do that. We seem to have been in today's meeting moving that forward, and committee have at least expressed a view of what they think the risk appetite score should be. I'm very happy to take that view. If, I mean, if it's a consensus, then great. But even if it's it's not, I'm happy to take that view to the risk management group for their further consideration. I mean, I, as your section one file, um, section one file, I believe the risk score is fine as it is. But you know, clearly, everything needs to be reviewed, and you know, and if there's a view that moving to 15 will provide the council more assurance then there's no reason why the risk management group shouldn't review that and, and come to a view and in feedback to the next audit committee whether that's agreed or the reasons why we we disagree with that could we uh, take that one step forward and just say we would be um, interested in the case studies that's what you're talking about isn't it that anecdotes of 
of examples of where this is, has happened rather than real, so that we have a, a greater level of, uh, of understanding. Would be that would be possible uh, to bring that to the January meeting? Is, is that something people would be happy to have, Charlotte, and then Dan? I, I think we do have to have um, more discussion of this, but I, I, I do wonder if in the interim, we, we should say uh, that, that we think uh, the level should be 15 because we want to pick up um, the, the, the examples that I gave and I've given others in the past. But I also take what Councillor Sharp says that there may well be things, um, for example, moderate direct effect on service delivery that happens when you're applying, that would be a 15. Would we really want that going to corporate management team? Not sure. So it might be a mix of us saying today that we think it should be 15, but us also saying that we think the grid needs to be looked at um, so that it, 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 it seems odd that a medium impact is a moderate direct effect on service delivery or a significant level of minor injuries of employees and or in instances of mistreatment or abuse. It seems odd that those are both given the same marking for impact. Um, so as a sort of interim, we go for 15, because that at least means that if there was something that was going to lead to death or minor injuries, it would go to corporate management team, but that we then review it to look at how it's all structured. I, yes. Um, <clears throat> I, don't, I, I don't think we should don't. mess about with it as uh, too often. <laughs> uh, I, think, I think, you know, there is, uh, we have a recommendation from our Section 151 officer, which, you know, I, I, I think in his subjective professional view, which is supported by the risk management group, I'm comfortable enough for now. To, but I do think that it would be good to understand the application of the formula better um, so that this can be appropriately analysed and challenged you know, next time. Um, and so uh, I'm, I'm all for that. I'm all for some examples and, you know, so that we can see, you know, the kind of thing that that group would place as a 15 and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm not for swapping it, swapping it back again in the interim. I think, I think we should go with what we have. The recommendation that we have holds for now. Uh, but we've asked as a committee for some more clarity before we're prepared to let it hold thereafter. I think we have to remind ourselves that we are not a decision-making committee here. We are an audit committee. And therefore, I actually um, agree with that, but I totally agree with, with the, the um, what we're saying is, is that if we leave it as that, we're only talking about two or three months, but actually then we drill down under, underneath. And I don't know where anybody's happy to make a recommendation because this, this report is for noting, but I think it, what we haven't done in the past perhaps is we've been a bit wishy-washy about saying to our officers exactly what we want them to do. And I want to be absolutely clear that Ian is able to take away uh, uh, something which is tangible. So I mean, Dan, I don't know whether you can articulate something. Sorry, before yeah, Dan does sorry. that, can I just come in? If, if you're wanting me and the risk management group to do that, it'd be really helpful if members could provide a few theoretical risks they would like us to score, which would then allow us to come to a view, you know, with those scores, where, where those risks should sit. And give us some homework to do. Yeah, I think that's an excellent idea, Charlotte. Sorry, I think that's missing missing the point because this is about our risk appetite. Yes, this is about us setting the framework within which the risk management group assesses risks and then having assessed those risks, what management level those risks get given. Um, so I, I don't think us coming up with, well, what risk would you give X, Y, Z? Is, is the point. The, the point is that we, we don't have a clear argument from the risk management group as to why they've come up with 16. We've all discussed that there are aspects of it that we don't like because there are things that would arithmetically come under 16, but actually we think they should be um, 
moved up. So I think it's the job of the risk management group to take those issues and come back with, with a, a report that gives us a, a, a proper appraisal, as it were, of, of explanation of what our risk appetite is and how these how these impact and, and likelihood grids work. Um, be, because as it stands, frankly, for me, it doesn't work. Through you, Chair, through great respect to Councillor Kane, that's what this report does do. It's exactly what this report does do. Councillor Kane has identified a few theoretical risks where she thinks should be above the risk appetite. All I've asked is if you can come up with other examples of risks which should be above the appetite, we can score those and then see whether they do actually, you know, where they would fit against the current um, appetite score. Yeah, I, I would I would agree with Ian that it's um that it's a very fair way forward, isn't it? Because what we're saying is it, you know, the, the numbers are all very well. But it's the application that we're interested in, isn't it? And so you can, you know, as you said earlier, Chair, you can set the appetite of whatever number you like, but it's actually in the application when, you, when you're met with a set of facts that it becomes real and meaningful. And, you know, I do have huge confidence that our officers would not allow something that, you know, put life at risk or the council at serious risk or anyone or anything at huge risk um, and so they would make sure that it was scored appropriately and it would go over the 16 threshold I have absolute confidence in that but as an exercise to to if the rest of the committee want further confidence in that in the application of the formula that we have in front of us and in the end it is only a formula like all formulas the application is as important as the formula itself because there is nuance, particularly when assessing risk, there is always nuance. Then that's a good way to test it, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So it would be, you know, as a, as a committee, that's our job. We test things. We test the robustness of things. We test systems. We ask that systems are questioned and checked. And, and I think the, Ian has presented us with a, a good way of doing that. So we should take him up on that and then, you know, then come back to the question. Well, are we then, are we happy with 1516 or 1615? So is that a, is that a, uh, a recommendation or a amendment or amendment that you're happy to go with? Dan? Sorry, Charles. Our, our, our risk management policy says, as an organization with limited resources, it's important for the council to seek to mitigate all of the risks it faces. The council therefore aims to manage risk in a manner which is proportionate to the risk faced based on the experience and expertise of its senior managers. The council has defined the maximum level of residual risk which it is prepared to accept as a maximum risk score of 15 in line with the scoring matrix attached at Appendix 1. I am saying very clearly, and I wish it to be minuted and my name to be put with it, that I am not happy uh, that we should accept a maximum risk of 15 in line with the current scoring matrix. That's fine, and we'll minute that, but I think what, Dan, if you can just clarify, I think what we're saying is that uh, accept the paper as, as it is, but do some more investigation into this before, because that's one step further. It's finding out, we don't have to make decisions immediately, it's one step further towards understanding and making sure that we are, we are secure that actually the amalgamation of scores to reach 15 is accurate, rather than that it's 15. I think that's what we are asking our, our a risk management group to, 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 to look at. If you just change it, all you do is change the categories underneath it and, and, and play with it. Whereas actually what we're doing is looking, wanting them to look at those categories. Are they actually right? Is, is five or, or three or whatever it is actually right? Um, uh, and whether or, or, or and, and under what circumstances would it be 15 plus or 40 or, or whatever? Because otherwise, if we don't drill down into that, all we're doing is playing with numbers. Um, yes, um, thank you, Chair. I'm just trying to, to, to move it forward. Um, 
I understand where Can Councillor Kane's coming from. I, I, I can't accept, obviously that, that would have to go full council. I can't accept that we increase or, or bring it down to 15. I can't remember the exact word. Without looking at the detail, I, I personally would like to see more information and thinking behind some of the subject um, subjective decisions made by the the senior management group before I could sort of formally or, or finally is probably a better word um, make it make a decision on this. But I understand that looking at it from sat here, and I obviously I haven't got the risk. Um, register in front of me but there, 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 there are some anomalies that don't sit comfortably and perhaps we should be looking at those and, and trying to understand why before we come forward with a, a formal if there is going to be a formal proposal to council so we we note the report but we are asking our officer to do what he said he was going to do we go back to the risk management group to look to look at that and if and provide us with um, examples of, 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 of that are appropriate or might be anomalies and also has asked us and I think to be fair to him it would be good for if we have ideas of, of how it works and we seem to have some expertise around the room so we might as well use that uh, as, as to where that doesn't actually work and then we would understand more. I think playing with the numbers is, is not going to get us where we want to be because it's not going to change any decision making, it's just going to change the matrix. And uh, and I appreciate that you're saying, well, 15 goes to the, but but, but we're just playing numbers. So can, can I ask, uh, I don't know whether I need to go to a vote on, on that, because I haven't really put a pro proper recommendation, Tracy, and she'll only shout at me about this. So, um, but that I would like to suggest that that's what we do, that we note the report, which we don't have to vote on, but that we actually ask uh, Ian to do what he proposed to do. So, and I know you've noted what you want. Yeah, your I, comments I, I would I would like to note something else and have yeah, it noted um, uh, in the minutes with my name. I have been asking about this for a very long time now. Um, I understand your way forward and uh, we have to find a way forward. However, I wish it noted that I personally do not accept um, a, 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 risk, a maximum risk score of 15 in line with the scoring matrix, I am not happy uh, that we would be we we wouldn't escalate um, uh, the possible death or the um, very likely uh, mistreatment or abuse of individuals. Uh, I'm I'm not content to accept that, and I want it accept noted. That. Accept that absolutely. Right, Ian, is that clear? Because are we are you clear with what we've said? Ish. Shall we have so, a discussion outside? So, I mean, my request was for members to provide me with theoretical risk they'd like me to score. So yeah, we can if, do that. if, that's, oh, some will. if that's part of the recommendation, I'm yeah. comfortable. Okay, there. we'll try to do that for you. Yes. Did you hear that? Um, no, I'm, no, I'm confused. No, it, also, but in addition to what Ian is doing, he would like us so, so to, to provide him with some details. So my understanding is correct. The motion was brought, um, and you want you to bring back some further information from us. Get to the committee, that right? Um, about um, the scoring matrix, and in return, I think Ian is asking for the mem for members of the committee to give examples. If you can, yeah. Is that a correct? concern? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A possible risk. A possible risk. Yes. Score. So we feel. Yeah. yeah. In order for us to demonstrate yeah. the application of the, of the formula. Yeah. And that's the point. Yeah. Whether it works or not. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Okay. Yes. Okay. We're going on to agenda number 11 impact of company. Are, are you taking a vote on that? Sorry. Um, well, I, I, I was just got, it was just an instruction to Ian. I mean, if you want to, if we need to make a recommendation on, on, on that, we don't normally do for noting. It was just an additional request, really, for Ian to uh, read I'd, back to the next meeting. I, I would prefer you did take a vote, and I would like it to be a recorded vote, please. Okay, that's absolutely fine. I'm not sure what we're voting. Uh, I, I don't quite know what you're going to, to to to. Is it clear what we're voting on? Are we all clear what we're voting on? So, if my understanding is correct. Yeah. 
So we are, you're noting the report, you're asking section 151 officer to provide further information on the application of the scoring matrix. And in return, the section 151 officer is asking audit committee members to provide some theoretical risks for the risk management group to score. Okay, is that okay for everyone? Right, okay, so we'll do a vote, uh, named vote then. Okay. <clears throat> so when I call your name, can you say whether you're voting for, against, or abstaining? Councillor Kane. Against. Councillor Every. For. Councillor Inskip. Against. Councillor Dan Schumann. For. Councillor Alan Sharp. For. So that's carried by three votes to two. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, impact of company accounts on group council group, sorry, council group accounts. Uh, again, this is a recommendation is to, to note the contents of the report, which will be introduced uh, by Ian. And we do have a couple of tabled questions. So, Ian. This paper states the changes to the trading company accounts that will need to be reflected in the council's group accounts. The reason for the changes have already been discussed with the Finance and Assets Committee and will be discussed at the next meeting of Operational Services Committee. Thank you. And, and uh, Charlotte gave a couple of questions, which of course will be attached to the minutes with the answers. So I didn't know whether you wanted to, to pick up any more questions on that, or are we happy to just note that? Charlotte. Uh, I, I am concerned. Um, pretty much ev every year, I think, since I've been on the audit committee, there have been issues caused to our group accounts by the trading company accounts. Um, and they always seem to come very late in the year. Um, I accept it's sort of uh, academic this year since they're not auditing till January anyway. Um, but in theory, uh, we well not in theory we did publish our draft accounts and it would have been better if we'd had uh, the correct figures from the trading companies to put in those accounts um, my bigger question um, which uh, is is a, well I, I guess it has been answered that we'll wait to see what the what the auditors say about whether we have to adjust our prior year accounts um, but it, it does it does seem odd that the, the trading companies this isn't the first time they've adjusted their prior year accounts I don't think uh, and and it 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 may not be material to our figures although the auditors may decide it is it it just really it doesn't seem good practice um, and uh, I I, I do wonder whether the uh, directors of the trading company are are fully on top of how to do trading accounts and getting them published, at, well, available to this council promptly and having them be correct. Um, I have another question, which is on 4.2a, where it says that um, we've discounted it um the the uh three million uh i just wondered what the discount rate was that that we used to arrive at the present value i don't know the answer to the top of the head no, we can... but we can we can get that but i mean this as i said this was presented to finance and assets committee where um nigel i think has attended the meeting and provided all the committee with all the answers requested but your comments are noted and uh is everybody happy to note the, the report and we'll move on to agenda item number 12 which is the financial management code which uh, again the recommendation is to the committee to uh note the contents of the report and again it's uh to report on it but we have no 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 questions tabled on that Thank you, Chair. Very simply, this report is for noting an updates committee on the report presented to the July meeting. Any questions on that? Charlotte. 4.4. 4. Um, it says the possibility of joint finance and performance reporting has been considered at corporate management team 
but it is believed that the current process of separate financial and performance reporting remains fit for purpose, so no change is planned at this time. Uh, we, we've had this earlier in this meeting. I, I, I don't think it's proper that we get papers that say it's believed. We should get papers that have evidence in them uh, that help us form a, a judgment. Um, I personally do not see how separate finance and performance reporting uh, allows uh, management, let alone members or the public, to understand uh, what is going on uh, in, in, in the council. Uh, at its most extreme, we could provide financial reports that show that everything is tickety-boo and going to budget, and we could provide performance reports that show that none of our performance targets are being delivered. It's important that those two things are brought together. So a bit like the discussion we had right at the beginning about value for money, which Councillor Schumann said, it's not just about the money, it's about the, the quality. And, and that's why the finance and performance reporting, the joint finance and performance reporting is really important. And I would like this committee to um, ask the corporate management team to um, bring back a timetable to this committee for introducing joint finance and performance reporting to start from the 1st of April, 2023. Otherwise, I just don't, I don't think we're getting a proper view as, as to um, the business of the council. Is that, is that a proposal? It's, I don't, I don't know if the recommendation has been moved yet, has it? Sorry. Uh, AM, would you like to, to respond to that? As Dita had in the paper, the current management team have, have discussed this. Clearly, the council has a robust process for financial reporting has, and has a robust process for performance reporting. And the strong view of the corporate management team is that those two things do not need to be. Um, put into one process at the moment, the two processes as they stand independently, it's working fine and, and so it doesn't need to be changed. So, so, so why does the corporate management team think that it wouldn't be useful to have joint finance and performance reporting? The future, as I just said, the corporate management team believes that the two system working independently on performance and finance is, is perfectly adequate for the council. That, that wasn't my question. My question was, why don't you think joint reporting would be useful? I think that is a, a, that, that qualifies the answer. This is what you're saying, isn't it? That uh, they're, they're saying that. So on what basis are they saying? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand trying why, to understand why, why corporate say. management team don't think joint finance and performance reporting would be useful. Yeah, we don't ask for clarification on that, don't we? Because otherwise it's a statement and we have nothing beyond the statement. So it would be nice for them to explain why that is the case. Is that something that can be done outside this? Ah, Alan. Um, yes, I, I don't necessarily agree with Councillor Kane in terms of having it in place by 1st of April, but I do think we as a committee need to understand the thinking of the um, corporate management team, why the finance and performance are not jumped, because a lot of organisations I've been involved in, you, you would have the two would be together. Um, so I think, you know, to try, again, try and move it on, I think we I, I want to understand the thinking behind that and would suggest that comes back to the next meetings or paper for the next meeting so we can actually have more detail around that and, and quiz, you know, and question. Have you got that, Tracy? Or do we have to do anything about it? Vote or recommend? The report, the report is currently for noting. Um, and if you want so we to, we have noted the report. Yes, well, they, that's the, rec the recommendation is to note the report. Um, if you want to add an additional thing to request CMT to clarify, um, re request clarification from CMT for the next meeting of the committee, you're entitled to add that on. But otherwise, the report is just for noting. Yeah. Okay. 
I was like, start. Oh, rather than just say clarify, which is a bit vague, I would like to say uh, provide a paper given their giving their reasons for why they don't think it would be useful uh, for joint finance and performance reporting. Okay. Okay, Tracy. So you're saying justification rather yeah, than rather clarification. Than. Okay. If I can just come back in on that, then yeah. we, we can you know, sort of explore it more. And it may be that we, we end up you know, preempting the committee that, that we, we, we would like it from the 1st of April. But let's, let's look. I, I don't think you know, I've got enough. Well, I haven't got the information, really. Um, so I think we need more information. Yeah, well, at this and stage, that, I'm I just think, asking for justification. Yeah. So that's, and I think yeah, that's part yeah. of our role as the audit committee is to... Yeah. Yeah, and that will be that will come yeah. to that will come to your January meeting. Request more information. Yeah. Right. So thank you very much. That brings us on to the January meeting and to the forward agenda. Um, obviously, they the ones that are printed stand, but we've got um, the uh, EGS coming again that um, Don is bringing, um, and we've asked for the request of clarification um, for. Uh, uh, that we've just done in the in every in, in, in the previous uh, paper, uh, information regarding safeguarding etc. and the queries that we've asked for during today's meeting will happen automatically through the internal audit progress report, which is on the agenda anyway. So we don't need to name that. So um, uh, that's what it looks like as an agenda. Any comments on that? Are you happy to go with that? Sorry, I, did, I didn't catch all of it, but we've. In, included in the agenda, we've got all the bits that we we want referred back I think, to. I think they're either okay. overt or they're included in other reports. I'm sure Tracy's captured them, the ones that yeah, we've said we can come so. back to the next meeting. Yeah. Okay. okay, thank you very much indeed. Well, that concludes uh, um, uh, the meeting. Thank you very much. I really apologise that it's so long, but I think it's really important that, that we uh, do work through these things uh, uh, systematically. And I thank you all for your time uh, for becoming involved. And also, if you've st still got the energy to, to, to listen in, that you're still there. And actually, for those people who we won't be speaking to between now and January, happy Christmas. <laughs> That's what we've got coming next. So thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>